No, I'm on. She's not on. Are we good? We're going to go ahead and get the meeting started. Commissioner Rotkin? Here. Commissioner Chase? Here. Commissioner Bottorf? Here. Commissioner McPherson? Commissioner Leopold? Here. Commissioner Alternate uh, Mulhern? Here. Commissioner Coonerty? Commissioner Caput? Here. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez? Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Brown? Commissioner Bertrand? Here. And Commissioner Lowe? Thank you. And for the record, this is the Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission, our transportation policy work workshop for Thursday, August 16th. And today we're going to start off with uh, oral communications. And uh, we've got presentations today, so we're just going to limit the presentation to two minutes. So if you can line up and come and talk about things that are not on our agenda, and it's okay to line up and save a little time. Thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, good morning, commissioners and members of the public. My name is Jack Nelson, and I attended your transportation policy workshop, I believe it was in June this year, and spoke about something that I'd like to elaborate on because I was um, referring to the April issue of Scientific American magazine in which uh, uh, a plain English summary of recent studies on the Arctic was published. And as I was holding up this, this magazine, um, Commissioner Rotkin was kindly was gesticulating at me, and he was trying to signal me that I was holding the magazine upside down, but I wasn't. The headline story here is Arctic Meltdown, and the uh, publishers chose to put that upside down because of it's kind of a way of communicating this can turn our world upside down. Um, the headline inside, uh, along with a picture of melting ice, uh, reads, the Arctic climate is shattering record after record, altering weather worldwide. Well, that's because what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic, and climate scientists are uh, examining how uh, a warming Arctic reduces the constraints on the uh, polar jet stream, and the jet stream in turn uh, misbehaves, and we get things like the ridiculously resilient ridge that gives California a drought. And drought plus heat makes hot drought, makes uncontrollable wildfires. So um, that's a really simple line of connection that, uh, you know, for me, uh, it doesn't make me depressed. It just makes me grieved that we as humans haven't acted sooner on this question. And we do have a shared responsibility. And as I'm here to point out, Again, I believe your commission has special responsibilities because you are the designers of, or at least the um, approvers of what we do with transportation. Um, and I have to shut up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. Gail McNulty, Santa Cruz County Greenway. Um, I just would like to take this opportunity to, first of all, reiterate and maybe update all of you on Greenway's um, current priorities, um, and then speak a little bit to the wonderful series that we have going on here. Um, so Greenway supports continuing freight rail service in Watsonville. We want to be clear on that. However, we do not want commuting options along the corridor to be lost as a result. We want to preserve future transit options along the corridor while exploring how current transit innovations, like the small electric minibuses currently being tested around the Bay Area, might coexist with bicycles and e-bikes on the corridor. Bike commuters, children, tourists, all need this safe new route, and we should be exploring how to make it as effective as possible for as many people as possible. The popularity of the new jump bikes in Santa Cruz offers some idea of just how popular this new safe route will be. Um, it's very nice that we are back here in Watsonville for the third RTC meeting in a row. Um, and it's, again, wonderful to see the speaker series continuing. I have a few takeaways that we have found from the speakers so far. For instance, Jarrett Walker, of course, talked about transportation options, how they equal freedom and opportunity. Um, Farhad Mansaran pointed out that smart is comfortable, 
Um, however, it does not seem to be a very equitable solution since it's a small, small part of their population that's benefiting from it, and it has not helped at all with Highway 1 grid gridlock. Kirk Triplett, in the short time he was allotted at the last meeting, um, pointed out that if we remove the rails north of Watsonville, as Kirkland did, our community could benefit from a trail well, our, conver our transit conversation continues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. And I'm looking for my time limit, is it? Oh, there it is. OK. <laughs> and thank you for those who are here from Caltrans. My comments are directed both to Caltrans and to local officials. Um, I follow personal rapid transit very closely, and in particular, suspended PRT, where you would have pod cars suspended from a monorail guideway. Uh, you may think this technology is pie in the sky, but it's getting a little more real with each passing month. There's at least five companies working on different versions of suspended monorail PRT. One is Skytran, based in Mountain View and also in Israel. They're designing a maglev system that could go up to 200 miles an hour. This means it could replace California high-speed rail, providing better service to more locations at a small fraction of the cost of high-speed rail. Um, another is Futran, F-U-T-R-A-N. Our own local Ron Swenson is deeply involved traveling back and forth to South Africa, building their prototype system. They expect to have a prototype that people can actually ride within a year from today. Um, and they expect to provide actual passenger service by 2020. If you know the local Swenson family, they're very successful at building things. It's a very well-designed system, and I expect they will be successful. Um, Ron Swenson is an excellent speaker, I think, for the Innovators in Transportation series should be considered. Um, so why do I support the personal rapid transit technology? It comes down to four Cs and an S. Carbon-free, capacity, convenience, cost, and safety. Carbon-free because the system can include solar panels to power itself. Capacity, maybe not passengers per vehicle, but a lot more passengers per hour than a train track or a bus lane. Convenience, instead of people waiting for the bus, we would have the pod cars waiting for the people. Cost, cheaper to build than high-speed rail, and operating costs much cheaper than any conventional bus or train. And safety, these systems are safe and cannot interact with people on the ground. So I'm out of time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Uh, Michael Saint, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, I'd like to uh, go back to August 2nd RTC meeting uh, where we had agenda item 18, which was entitled California Hits Its Climate Goal Early, but its largest source of pollution keeps rising. And if we all don't know which that is, that's transportation. Uh, basically, the reason we hit our goal was electricity's generation has plummeted due to Monterey Bay community power, <coughs> renewables, less coal, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is transportation pollution is rising from 2013 to 2016. Car and truck pollu pollution has risen 8 million tons. Uh, the reason for this, which some of this was pretty surprising to me, low gas prices. I'm thinking we as an, a society have grown accustomed to $4 a gallon gas, um, growing an economy, which is a good thing. Uh, consumers' preference for roomier, less efficient vehicles. That is a change in people's thoughts about tra transportation, which is hard to change. Also, slower adoption of EVs. These factors are wiping out gains from states' emission-cutting regulations. Transportation pollution is nearly double the next highest polluter, which is industry. In summary, uh, to reach our 2030 emission goals, we have to double greenhouse gas reductions. The recommendations are cleaner electrical grid, which I mentioned earlier, Monterey Bay Community Power has done this for us. A rapid shift to zero emission vehicles powered by that grid. And I'd like to add one of my own personal ones. No projects that give single occupancy vehicles more incentive to be used as the primary source of trips. EVs will not solve the congestion problem we have on Highway 1. I believe this RTC has the responsibility to get people out of their cars and to meet California's greenhouse gas emission standards, helping to cut transportation emissions and vehicle miles traveled. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saint.
morning, Commissioners. I'm David Leiby. I uh, live in Santa Cruz at, near Depot Park, where we have rail traffic all the time from <clears throat> Roaring Camp. We went to, uh, my wife and I went to the presentation that was given at uh, the Simpkins Center by the smart uh, people, and we decided to go up and ride it, which we did this uh, last weekend, and it was really a wonderful experience. And I seem to have got a different view of what it was going to be like than a previous speaker about the amount of people that get taken off of the uh, transportation corridor by a rail. It's, it doesn't seem like a lot, but if you took maybe five or six hundred cars off of that, off of Highway 1 and put people on a rail, you would have a lot less congestion of people even just trying to get on Highway 1, which is any other solution this pro has been presented in some of the uh, meetings I've been to is like put more transportation on that corridor. You just more and more people trying to get into that narrow, narrow slot is never going to be a good solution as far as uh, as far as I can see. And I, I really support the idea of keeping a rail and making it viable for people to actually use to get somewhere. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Nick Belich. I'm a Watsonville resident. I'm going to talk about the little initiative that could. So there's a children's story about a little train that could, where the little train has to haul up a big hill and it says, I think I can, I think I can. This uh, Greenway Corridor initiative that's over there in Capitola, which looks like RTC is getting into, uh, is the little initiative that could. And in, the, in, the, in my mind, what it could do is expose a lot of rot which is unfortunate. Citizen initiatives, most of the time, government bodies and elected officials hate citizen initiatives. They do a lot of tricks against them. Not always. Sometimes they'll do it where they'll order a study, City of Capitola did. They use funny wordy on a ballot question, which goes before the voters, City of Capitola did. They file a lawsuit, City of Capitola did. Only one left, really, is the big one, is to use taxpayer dollars for informational purposes to try to sway the voters. I certainly hope Capitola does it, and I certainly hope RTC doesn't do it. Now we have a burning question here about a letter that I'm not sure really was turned in or not, but from your executive director, Georgia Dondero, to City of Capitola, saying uh, you should, the council, your council should refuse to place it on the ballot, and that it is the initiative. City Council has no legal right to refuse to place it on the ballot. None. Zero. Their city attorney told them that. They either place it on the ballot or adopt it, adopt it as is. They can go file a lawsuit, and it's the courts to decide whether or not it goes on the ballot. So if such a letter was really sent with such language, giving legal advice, and not only that, but bad legal advice, there really should be an apology to the RTC members, to the city of Capitola, and to the members of the public. Hopefully, we're not having taxpayer dollars used on this issue. Thank, Thank you for your comments. Good morning, Commissioners. Steve Trujillo, candidate for City Council, Watsonville 7th District. Um, when I'm in my rounds of the district talking to voters at their door, I need to let you know there is no enthusiasm for expanding Highway 1. None. Zero. Zip. Nobody wants any more lanes on Highway 1. There is enthusiasm for rail and trail. A great deal of enthusiasm, including people who are even older than I am, and I'm older than the dirt under this building, 65. They would like to try uh, a, a transit, public transit, in uh, maybe the smart car or maybe one of the other uh, systems that the other gentleman just mentioned with great enthusiasm. And again, it does come down to the fact that, yeah, I'm convinced we're producing 8 million more tons of crap into the air than we were three years ago. And uh, it's, it is because we're driving bigger cars. I know I drive a little car, a cute little Honda Fit, 
which pollutes, still pollutes, but very little. And uh, it would be nice also to have incentives for people to buy those types of cars rather than those great big, fat, huge Ford SUVs. But that's just a personal prejudice. In any event, I wanted to report to you what the people, what the actual people out there living in East Watsonville are saying. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Barry Scott. I live in Aptos. Um, I, I wanted to uh, share a celebration uh, that last Thursday there is a groundbreaking in Salinas for the uh, Salinas to Gilroy extension. Fabulous project. It's going to have a station in Pajaro where our, our, th our uh, rail line ends and that may be operational we hope in 2022. Imagine that. A rail line that we own that's actually active and recognized by the federal government and the state government that could run passenger uh, cars before too long and connect at Pajaro to jobs up and down the uh, state. Um, while I was there, I, I spoke to someone, I'm sorry I left his card at home, Chad, something I think from the California State Transportation Agency, and we were chatting about train technologies and, and, uh, and, and, and it came up, what, what kind of train might Santa Cruz have? And when you do, the enough research, you, you find that the likelihood, and this has been said over and over again, is the likelihood that is that they will be battery electric, multiple units. That was the term he used, BEMUs. And, um, you know, for, for the presentation that we had that we enjoyed last week about the smart train, I want everyone to understand that the smart train is a huge vehicle. It's a different train than was looked at in our, in our study. Our 2015 study identified a light diesel multiple unit that had much lower floors, uh, much smaller physically car, uh, the cars, the rail vehicles, and was a lighter vehicle. By the time we actually deploy anything, the chances are that it'll be like a Tesla, a very light electric, battery electric, powered by Monterey Bay Community Power renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Peter Stanger. Um, I just cycled in here. I want to congratulate uh, everybody else on the commission here, everybody else that's in the audience that uh, cycled or took mass transit, the metro to get here. You were part of the solution, not part of the problem. For the rest of you, well, I guess that puts you on the other side. Um, I wanted to thank you for the speaker series again. I thought it was really illuminating. It helped me define what I feel is necessary for Santa Cruz County and for South County residents. As a long time, 45 year South County resident, I know that I need um, transit as well as a bicycle route that's safe for everyone to use. And um, I would like to encourage you to stand behind those two principles, transit and also transportation on, for safe bicycles, and not endorse any one means, uh, like a train or anything else at this moment, and keep your minds open, please. Um, also, I'm a little bit concerned about um, how much of the funding goes uh, to um, or not to infrastructure, especially here in South County. Um, while North County is working on uh, Segment 7, while North County is devising the um, bridge over the San Lorenzo River, while North County got the Yacht Harbor um, and Twin Lakes improvements here in South County, um, I still have to pedal along Beach Street at 40 miles an hour traffic with no bike lane, and I just don't see the wisdom in that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Lowell Hurst. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a reaction I get uh, going door to door sometimes, too. We knew you'd like that. Thank you. As the, uh, as the alternate, I'm required to think in alternate terms uh, sometimes. And uh, nobody's brought up the traffic report yet. So let's uh, get the traffic report out. It's bad. It's bad going north. It's bad coming south. It's bad from Moss Landing and Monterey. Yesterday I was at the airboard on Silver Cloud in Monterey. And coming back from that, I'm looking at the air 
being from the airboard, and, and I see this big cloud of dust. And sure enough, somebody's doing an alternative mood mode, an alternative mood move on on the road. That section of road between Salinas Road and Moss Landing is a there's a little wider shoulder. So there's a produce truck and a whole string of cars, and somebody moves over into the shoulder and passes the line of cars and the produce truck. Great big cloud of dust. Well, monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> somebody else pulls out there, and this guy's got a big four-wheel drive, and it's bouncing up and down, and stuff's starting to fly out of his bed, and the dust cloud is getting bigger and bigger. But the truck driver, he gave him, gave him a little bit of room, and so he moved over there too. And so that gave me the conclusion that four-wheel drive on the shoulder is probably the new modus operandi, at least in North Monterey County. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hurst. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close the public comment period. Before I move on, any commissioner comments at this time? Commissioner Bertrand. Yeah, um, yeah thanks to George and the RTC staff for putting this speaker series on. certainly helps us expand our vision of possible solutions. Thank you. Um, so with the put off of or postponement of the uh, investment study, I'm a little concerned about a couple of things, and that is our available time to completely digest this report. Um, it's going to be a complicated report that's going to influence uh, this area, Santa Cruz County, and beyond for many years to come. So I'd like to propose that on the next agenda item for the RTC that we consider a side commission of members on this commission here to do a deep dive into that study and report back to the commission itself. Obviously, this wouldn't be a recommendation, but it would be commissioners here who would take the time out of their normal schedule and really dig deep into that report, try to understand all the details. And I know some of us have that time, and so those are the people that be on that commission. They would self-volunteer. So that we get an idea from commissioners beforehand some of the aspects that may not be visible in the executive report. Thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, uh um, Mr. Chair, let me just say that I've talked with Mr. Dondero. Uh, we will have an item on the September 6th agenda that talks about what our timeline is, to, th that we can all see what's going on. The, the idea is to get this report out and give people uh, time to take a look at it, and we're going to, we should all do a deep dive. This is an, an important document for, um, uh, for the commission and the choices it's going to make at the end of it. Thank you for that. Okay, I don't really want to discuss it at this point, but we will have that item on the agenda in September, and we can get further into that discussion at that point. And all commissioners come prepared to weigh weigh in on that at that point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda today? No. Okay. Thank you. So that takes us on to the regular agenda, and today we continue our uh, transportation series. So, Mr. Dondero, I'll let you take over and introduce uh, the first. Speaker. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So it's a um, great pleasure to um, continue our series. We've been getting lots of positive feedback, uh, both from commissioners and from the public on this series. And um, today we're uh, very pleased to have Kyle Gradinger, uh, who's the division chief of Caltrans Division of Rail and Mass Transit, um, to uh, sort of follow up on a presentation that he gave to you last fall on the state rail plan. Um, Kyle did a great job of covering the state rail plan when he was here, I think it was October last year. Uh, but a lot of questions came out of that and I've had some conversations with him and I said, you know, it would be great if we could uh, pull out some of the details of, of what the state rail plan means for the state of California and how that connects or could connect or, or affect uh, your future decisions on this commission. And so he said, yeah, that would be a good thing to do. And um, there were some other things that sort of um, tied in to, to the overall uh, perspective of the rail plan. There's been a lot of questions about evolving technology in the rail industry, which there seems to be a very little um, knowledge about that and particularly about the funding that's available now for rail, plan, uh, rail programs in the state. So um, I did speak with Kyle yesterday and he, he does walk his talk. He was uh, riding the Capitol Corridor train from 
Sacramento to get here, and he, then he rode the bus, uh, the 17 Express to Santa Cruz, and then another bus here to Watsonville. So he's, um, he's also an avid cyclist, but he uh, is a, a great believer in better public transportation for everybody, and I think he um, comes with some, some great experience and ideas to share. So Kyle, uh, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to return and, and speak again. I, I, Sunday I'll get the memo and I'll, I'll dress down for Santa Cruz. It's, it's, it's very nice here. I, I can't help myself. <laughs> um, well, I, I would uh, thank you for the introduction, George. Uh, I would mention that there was actually a fourth mode I took yesterday. I began my trip. Uh, I, I left my house uh, on my bike uh, with my wife and two young kids, and they decided since Dad was going out of town for a few days, they would uh, hop on the bike with Mom, and we would go tour the, uh, the mural arts program that's going on in Sacramento, take a look at a few murals, and then I would head to the train station. So bike to the train, uh, train to San Jose, and then fantastic service on Santa Cruz Metro, the Route 17, and then the 69W last night, and then a nice walk down, down Main Street here in, in Watsonville, and, and here I am. It works. Um, it's, 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 it doesn't, it's not as fast as a car at 2 in the morning, uh, but it certainly beat dealing with traffic on a Thursday afternoon or a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, and so we think there's an awful lot of opportunity uh, in California to improve um, the situation on public transportation. It can get you where you want to go, but we think it can become the mode of choice. Um, but that is going to come with a partnership with other modes as well, uh, transit, rail, biking, walking, and other first and last mile solutions. So I'm going to try to keep it, um, well, I'm never good at keeping it brief. Uh, I'm going to give a quick recap of, of the state rail plan and try to dive into some of the issues that George mentioned, and hopefully uh, you will have some questions. I know I will not touch on everything, even though I will talk a lot. Um, so. Uh, a quick overview of the state rail plan. And, and first of all, I should clarify, I, I am the assistant division chief uh, for rail and mass transportation. We have now a permanent uh, division chief, and that is Daryl Wheeler. She was the chief of staff to Caltrans director Malcolm Doherty. And I think that is a fantastic symbol of the importance that Caltrans is, is giving to uh, rail and mass transportation now that, that they have, uh, have given us uh, one of the, the best and brightest and someone who is very critical in helping Malcolm Doherty do his job over the last several years at, at Caltrans. And I, I really enjoy working with her. And, and she shares uh, in the vision that, that we have and that Deputy Secretary Chad Edison uh, at California State Transportation Agency has. So uh, a quick overview of the rail plan. We are still uh, in the draft. The final version, I, I presented last November on the draft, which had just come out. The final version is, is really waiting, ready to go. We're just getting final talking points together. So I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll have it out uh, uh, imminently. Um, not a whole lot has changed since then. Some of the details, the high-speed rail business plan came out uh, in early June. So we wanted to make sure that, that we were lining up nicely with what high-speed rail authority is working on as well. Uh, and then some specifics about projects that have been evolving since since the draft was released in June, uh, November of last year. So what we're looking at uh, is a 20-year vision or 22-year vision for rail in the state of California. Uh, we are going in a different direction than traditional state rail plans had gone in the past. They were very much an inventory of what rail lines are out there and maybe one or two projects. Uh, California, under the leadership of the State Transportation Agency, has taken a whole new approach and really grabbed the bull by the horns and said rail can solve a lot of the problems that we have in the state and we want to really support it. Uh, so we are taking a vision now uh, that looks at an integrated statewide network of passenger rail, and inner city and commuter, high-speed rail, uh, integrated express buses to the regions of the state where, bus, where, where rail does not make sense, and as I mentioned, the, the other contributing first and last mile modes, walking, biking, jump bikes, uh, um, Lyft, Uber, all the solutions. We want to have them all work together uh, more, more closely. On the rail side and, and with the integrated express bus, what we're looking at is coordinated schedules. The idea of a regular pulsed service, uh, repeating timetables. Every hour or every 30 minutes or more in major metropolitan areas, you will have a train running on a line. If you live in, in Aptos or if you live in Fresno, you know that if you show up at your local station at that time, 33 minutes past the hour or three minutes past the hour, there will be a train in the direction you'd like to go. And then down the road, that train meets with other services to connect it to the rest of the state at pulse hubs where the trains come into the station uh, around the same point in time, transfers are quick and you move on. Uh, and additionally, we really wanted to apply a customer focus to the vision in the state rail plan. This isn't about building projects, this is about providing a service that we want people to use. So we're really focusing on seamless first and last mile access. We're looking at integrated ticketing, uh, the idea that yesterday I, I had to use three 
apps for information and ticket purchasing and then still cash fares to get on the bus. Uh, is there an easier way to do this? Is there, is there a one-stop shop like Uber provides now for their cars and their bikes, jump bike? Uh, can we do this statewide? Uh, and so we talk about some strategies to do that as well. And the state rail plan creates a vision that is both auto and air competitive, that it can pre provide trips that are uh, a, a potential replacement for long distance statewide trips, as well as uh, local trips that would be driven every day. Mm -hmm. When we looked at the rail plan, uh, at, at the ridership model, and where we were headed in 2013 when the rail plan process began, um, what you see in this, this graphic on the right is the counties of California uh, lined up roughly from north to south. Uh, you see the, the Bay Area, San Francisco, and the Caltrain corridor uh, there in, in the middle, and then Metrolink and, and Los Angeles services in the south. Um, what we saw was, was uh, uh, a vision of just sort of incremental growth uh, and, and the link between Northern California and Southern California by the 2013 state and by 2040 in a business as usual scenario. We finally got 500 passengers a day, which is enough people to show a line on the map connecting the, the, the two uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles regions. Um, there, there is continued growth on the rail side, but we realize that uh, there is a market potential for networked services and we've been planning things corridor by corridor not thinking about the entire system and when we put it together and put together a network where we have those time schedules and the services that are that are uh, able to take you from a to b and then from b onto c d and e uh, and provide real options and real connections that that network uh, can create far greater growth and this is what the ridership looks like under the network vision that we modeled during the rail plan process uh, we go from about 120,000 trips a day on commuter and inner city rail. So that's San Joaquin's, Capital Corridor's, Caltrain. It doesn't include Metrolink, BART, or um, uh, light rail systems. But if you look at just commuter and inner city rail, uh, that ridership grows from about 120,000 trips per day to 1.3 million trips per day. We are also looking at opportunities to drive down uh, the cost for rail. Uh, if, if you look at rail around the world, the U.S. is traditionally a very high price market, high cost uh, market, especially on the passenger rail side. The freights do a fantastic job moving goods, moving a ton of, you know, uh, of, of freight. But on the passenger side, we've been faced with very high operating costs. Uh, and we've, we think that with changing federal rules and with opportunities to look at re, re, uh, another approaches to delivering service and, and maintenance and things like that, uh, and by just operating a more efficient uh, timetable and network, we can drive down the costs to operate rail significantly. The cost per train mile, we think we can, what it costs to carry one train one mile, cruise, fuel, equipment, uh, we think we can reduce down to uh, by about 45%. Um, global international standards are, are, are around $20 per train mile. We think we can get it down from our 65 to the high 30s. Uh, and the cost per seat mile, we can drive down even farther. As the system grows, as, as the uh, trains become more full, um, the cost of adding an additional rider is minimal. Uh, we have empty seats on trains or we can add a coach to a train for a very low cost. And so the marginal cost of adding riders to a train is incredibly low. So the cost per seat mile drops down even more and becomes a much more efficient service. So this is the jumping to the the actual vision to the maps. Uh, I'm sorry, the colors aren't showing up incredibly well on the screen here. I hope they're better on your, your computer monitors. Uh, but what we're looking at is uh, three time frames. 2022 is the immediate time frame, 2027 the 10 year vision, and then 2040 the, the, the long term vision in the rail plan. And, and we have d drawn the maps, uh, the colors indicate, unfortunately I apologize to those in the room, the colors indicate the frequency of train service uh, and, and, and uh, how, how many times per hour service may operate and speed, a combination of the two. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time describing that looking at this image. <laughs> um, but basically, what we're looking at is, is uh, services such as the Caltrain service on the San Francisco Peninsula operating at 15 minutes or better frequency throughout the day. Uh, and then other services such as the Capital Corridor out to um, Sacramento and Auburn, up to an, um, one train per hour, San Joaquin's as well. And you see that in the expansions of service, uh, you can see the, the Salinas extension, which was mentioned by a previous speaker, uh, and, and the Smart Train corridor extending up to Windsor and down to uh, Larkspur Ferry, um, which is a project I'll talk about in a moment. By 2027, uh, we begin to see a, 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 a bigger increase in the frequency of service, making it a much more available, um, making rail a much more viable and, and available option to passengers throughout the Northern California area. 
uh, and some service restructuring. And then by 2040, um, you begin to see that high-speed rail has, uh, has connected Gilroy to Madeira through uh, uh, Pacheco and that we now have a full uh, Bay Area to Los Angeles high-speed rail system with a hub at Gilroy where a Monterey Bay rail network can plug in and provide access uh, across the state so that the Santa Cruz branch line would not just be uh, a branch line for Santa Cruz County, but that it plugs into the statewide system and, and gives you a, a 35, 40-minute ride from Gilroy into Fourth and King in San Francisco or a two-hour ride to Los Angeles uh, with a cross-platform transfer in Gilroy. So that's uh, a very quick synopsis of, of the vision. This is how, uh, I, I believe I shared this last time I was here, but this is an example of how these pulse hub stations work. This is, this, um, Switzerland is a country which has perfected this. Every, uh, every day in, this, in a country of seven million people, uh, there are trains and buses throughout the, the country that run on a 30 minute headway, uh, 30 minute interval. And, and the way that they do this is they've designed their infrastructure and their timetables so that uh, trains and buses meet at the top and the bottom of the hour and bring people into the system and, and, and send them back out like gears in a machine. Uh, and this is a town called Vetsikon. It's about 45 minutes southeast of, of uh, Zurich. It's in the metropolitan area. These are S-Bahn regional commuter trains. Um, three or four lines converge in this small town of about 10,000 people. There's another dozen or so bus lines, which then fan out to small villages of, of uh, 100 to 1,000 people or so. And every day, every half hour, Monday through Sunday, uh, this cycle repeats itself. They introduced this system in, 19, uh, in 2001 uh, across the entire nation. And this is a, a, a story where they wanted to build a high-speed rail line between Zurich and, and uh, Geneva. Went to the voters with it in 1987, and the voters said, and well, it's a, it's, a, it's, a it's a country with a lot of rural residents, it's a federal system. They said it benefits the bankers in Zurich and, and the UN workers in Geneva. What does it do for the other five million people in Switzerland? We want service too. They went back to the drawing board and they came up with a system that creates services that are reliable and dependable for every resident in the country, providing this network where you can tie in whether you're in a village of 10 in the Alps or whether you're in a metro area of a million. And that's what we're gonna hopefully recreate in the state of California um, with these systems that tie in together and provide benefits across the state. <clears throat> so some of the outcomes that we're looking at uh, with the 2040 vision in the state rail plan is <clears throat> we're looking at the opportunity to significantly reduce uh, um, the CO2 emissions per passenger mile. Uh, and, and by significantly, I mean, at the graphic in the lower left, uh, you see that we're, we're cutting it by, um, I believe it's, at the math, 100 fold or so, <laughs> from, from around 175 um, uh, uh, grams per, uh, per mile traveled down to uh, around five or, five or 10. We're looking heavily at opportunities to electrify or to use um, um, hybrid train technologies uh, and looking at battery electric as well. And we also assume that, that uh, cars will become cleaner over time, so we're giving credit on the highway side as well. We do hope that the current trend reverses. Um, as I mentioned, current ridership on, on inner city and commuter rail goes from about 100,000 trips per day to 1.3 million. Uh, and really importantly, in the lower right, you see the mode share. Today, commuter inner city rail cover about a third of a percent of all the passenger miles traveled in the state of California. Um, that's not much in the big universe of things. It does mean that a third of a percent of the miles traveled are people who are enjoying the ride, getting to check the, the newspaper and, and do things and be productive on the way and not dealing with traffic congestion. But we think we can grow that to almost 7% statewide of all passenger miles traveled uh, on the rail mode. In metropolitan areas where congestion is heavy, we think that this rail network, which is going to combine long distance inner city services as well as improved commuter and regional services, that share on, on rail can grow far more, perhaps in the, the 15 or 20% of all passenger miles traveled range. And that's where we really get this dent in, in greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> so I mentioned uh, the three time frames, and these are just a couple of Northern California uh, highlights of what we're looking at in, in 2022, and I'll talk about 27 and, and 2040 in a moment. Um, but by 2022, these are funded and committed improvements um, that, are, that are also now enhanced by funding provided through Senate Bill 1. Uh, so one is, is Caltrain electrification. That project is on track uh, for a 2022 uh, uh, operation. These are projects that will happen by uh, or before 2022. We'll be expanding service on the Smart Line in Sonoma and Marin County um, uh, to the Larkspur Ferry, and we'll be expanding the, uh, the, the service now down to Tamsi with two trains, uh, to Salinas with two trains a day with, with Tamsi. Uh, 
Uh, we're increasing service in the Sacramento to Stockton corridor, um, and, and the ACE rail uh, commuter service will be extending from Stockton down to uh, Ceres and Merced. And we're looking at those early efforts to think about an integrated uh, ticketing, integrated travel planning system to make it easier for the user, and also to reduce the, the costs that transit agencies and rail operators have uh, to actually collect revenue and provide a ticket to passengers. By the 2027 timeframe, what we're looking at is, is high-speed rail uh, having its two uh, initial segments open, the Central Valley segment and the San Francisco to Gilroy segment. Um, we continue at that point in time, we'll be working to integrate uh, regional and inner-city rail with high-speed rail so that we can extend the work that's being done in the Central Valley from Merced or Modesto. We'll have improved service from there up to Sacramento. We'll also look at opportunities for this region to tie in to high-speed rail at Gilroy. And by that point in time, we hope to have full implementation of a statewide integrated ticketing effort that the high-speed rail operator can, can come in and, and use. Uh, by 2040, we'll have, uh, again, by 2040, we'll have high-speed rail operating from San Francisco all the way to Anaheim. We'll have connections up to Sacramento and phase two connections uh, uh, to the Inland Empire and down to San Diego. We're also looking at the opportunity for a new Transbay crossing. Uh, whether that is a, a BART only tube or whether that is a BART and conventional rail tube, that could provide opportunities for one seat rides between Sacramento, downtown San Francisco and San Jose and, and, and really become an artery in Northern California. And we're looking at new regional networks feeding into the system. So a completed uh, 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 Monterey Bay uh, regional rail network uh, in the Central Valley. We're looking at connections across the valley, Lemoore, Hanford, uh, tying into high-speed rail and North Bay, uh, mm -hmm. smart tying into the capital corridor at Sassoon City. So I, I want to try to get into a few more of the details that, I, that we didn't have uh, in November. So when we look at rail funding in the state, we have three primary sources. We have the California Climate Investments, which is the cap and trade, or the GGRF funds. Uh, those funds have, have uh, um, uh, steadied. Uh, I arrived in California about a year and a half ago, and at that time we were getting some poor auction results. But immediately after, uh, after I arrived, uh, uh, the legislature approved the new 2030 targets for greenhouse gas emission reductions, and that has affected the market. And cap and trade auctions have been very successful since that point in time. So we provided certainty into the market, and we're getting a lot of money back out of those, those auctions now. The public transportation account tied to, tied to the Transportation Development Act. Uh, of the early 1970s. That is traditionally the, the bread and butter for our uh, uh, rail operating and capital dollars in the state. Uh, we, we, we have about $130 million a year that we provide to Amtrak services and additional PTA money is used uh, to, to fund uh, minor capital improvements on that rail system. Whatever we don't use goes back into the STIP and then we try to identify uh, rail and transit projects uh, out of that shared pool with highway. And then since last year, we now have SB1 revenues, the, one, the, the SB1 revenues that are funding rail and transit uh, to the tune of about $750 million per year in California are primarily the diesel excise tax and the vehicle license fee. So those dollars are coming primarily from trucking companies and from this uh, vehicle license fee where if you have a 20-year-old uh, uh, cheap automobile, you're not paying a very much larger increase uh, in your vehicle license fee. But if you are just buying an $80,000 Mercedes, your vehicle license fee is, is more than my um, $20,000 Subaru. Uh, and so um, that's, we, we feel a very fair um, um, licensing approach. And that's where a lot of the money for, uh, for rail and transit improvements is coming from. So as I mentioned, that totals up to about $750 million a year for rail and transit capital and operating support in California, uh, which is a significant funding source. And I came from the Federal Railroad Administration, where we had spent uh, 11 or $12 billion uh, in, in federal stimulus funds uh, after 2009. And the amount of money and, and the, the self-help that California is giving itself now is, is, is greater than the federal government uh, gave in the last decade or so. And so it's really a pleasure to be working here and have the opportunity and the support uh, of legislature to, to spend the money in the areas where I believe the money needs to be spent. Uh, so with those funding sources, we have a, a number of, of capital programs that are funded. The largest of which is the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program. I'll go into that in a little more detail in a moment. Uh, state Rail Assistance is a small additional operating fund for the inner city operators as well as the commuter rail operators in the state. Uh, we also have um, the STIP, where we continue to look for capital uh, improvement projects. 
um, uh, the PTA. I'm sorry, that's not a, that's a source, not a not a uh, program. This, and then under SB1, there's three new programs that were created for which rail and transit are competitive. The Solutions for Congested Corridor program uh, looks to identify opportunities for uh, um, uh, multimodal investments in corridors. The Trade Corridor Enhancement Program uh, can apply to, um, to rail, especially in areas with, with, uh, where freight improvements could also benefit passenger rail, and Sustainable Communities Planning Grants. So the Transit Inner City Rail Capital Program, uh, I, I think of this as sort of the stimulus for rail in California. Um, it is a, a program uh, that was created to provide competitive grants for transformative capital investments that will improve the statewide network of, of rail and transit and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Its primary goals are to, as I mentioned, reduce those greenhouse gas emissions and increase transit and rail ridership. We also want to improve network integration, create that statewide cohesive network, uh, and improve transit safety. We also have uh, secondary objectives to provide benefits to DACs, or disadvantaged communities, uh, and provide geographic equity in the program. And we also want to provide benefits to freight movement. <clears throat> so we've had three, three funding rounds uh, of TIRCP. The first two were funded solely with cap and trade revenues from those, those sort of unstable uh, early auctions. And the third round uh, was funded by the more stable cap and trade uh, auctions and the new SB1 revenues. Um, so in the first two years, we gave out about uh, $600 million uh, for projects. And in April of this year, we announced awards for over $4 billion worth of Transit Inner City Real Capital Program projects. $2.7 uh, billion is for projects in the first years, uh, one through five of the program. We also have the ability to uh, write a letter of no prejudice and fund longer term projects in the six to 10 year time frame, the way that the federal government does uh, with their, their uh, uh, full funding grant agreements. And so that, that way we were able to forecast revenues from greenhouse gas and SB1 and provide uh, awards for four, over $4 billion worth of projects. Um, this is an exciting program. This is the down payment. This isn't the down payment. This is, this is a, a significant chunk uh, uh, moving toward the state rail plan vision and actually beginning implementation. In Northern Cal we, we chose uh, around 30 projects statewide. And in Northern California, this is just a, sa uh, a sampling of the projects that we selected for TIRCP awards um, in, in Northern California. Uh, funding the BART extension to San Jose, uh, Trans Bay Corridor core capacity so that, that BART can run more trains uh, through the tube. We funded additional EMUs, which are the new electric double-decker trains that Caltrain will be operating, a 101 express bus pilot with Samtrans, electric buses. Every single agency that came in for buses, uh, we worked with the Air Resources Board, and we, we said, congratulations, you've won an award, but your diesel bus will now be an electric bus. <laughs> so we, we're working with them now to roll out uh, infrastructure deployment uh, on the electric side. And, and that's going to be a, 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 a big thing to tackle, but we're all going to be better for it if we figure this out and roll it out. <clears throat> We bought more light rail vehicles for San Francisco Muni. We funded the smart extensions to Larkspur Ferry in Windsor. We've also funded uh, additional research uh, into an east-west branch line, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, in the San Joaquin uh, Joint Powers Authority, we funded their Valley Rail program uh, to the tune of about $500 million to improve uh, services between the Central Valley communities, Stockton, Modesto, Merced, Fresno, up to uh, Sacramento, which we believe is not, not only a growing market, but a very strong uh, uh, market statewide. Solano Transportation Authority integrated uh, ZEV, electric express buses in that corridor, uh, where we'll be shifting the capital corridor onto a slightly different alignment through the Bay Area, which will shave about 10 minutes off the travel time between Oakland and San Jose. And then uh, many of these awards included what we call a network integration component. Uh, it's a little bit of extra money that we've provided to make sure that the investments we're making are tying into the broader network. So that could be things like this integrated ticketing uh, study that we're working on. It can be um, ensuring that where BART and Caltrain meet, that we have a cross-platform transfer and that the, 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 the opportunity to transfer is seamless for the user. So I'm going to dive into three of the, the projects that I think are very relevant um, in Northern California. The first is, is SMART. Uh, we, we, they have not had a normal day of operation. I know that I, I don't want to take any words out of the mouth of, of Farhad Mansourian, uh, but they began, I believe, three or four weeks before the tragic fires last year uh, in Santa Rosa. And um, who knows if their ridership model will ever have a real um, uh, actual day to, to be tested upon because they went straight into emergency operations and providing hospital evacuations. And then residents were displaced and moved north in the county. And now they have a tremendous park and ride demand at the north end that they never foresaw. Um, but they've been resilient and they provided a very important alternative uh, to travel in the, in the Sonoma Marin 101 corridor since they started. Uh, and and um, so we are continuing to help them expand that service down again to the Larkspur Ferry and up to Windsor. 
And uh, importantly, we, we really think that there's an opportunity there to connect that north-south spine with an east-west, what they call umbilical cord, to the rest of the world, to tie them into the network so that it's no longer something you have to drive up to uh, Marin County to get to, uh, but that uh, a, a traveler from Nevada uh, who needs to go to Sacramento to, to do something at the Capitol uh, has an option to avoid traffic in the, the 37 corridor, the congested corridor on the north side of, of San Pablo Bay. Um, we think that there's an opportunity there to connect along an old rail line. It won't be a high-speed rail line by any means, but it provides a, a valid, reliable uh, transportation option to get from Marin and Sonoma counties to Solano and onto Sacramento without having to be stuck in that uh, chronic congestion in that corridor in an area where adding a lane is going to be uh, next to impossible. Uh, so that's something we're very excited about supporting as well. <coughs> uh, the Salinas Rail Extension was mentioned. We had the groundbreaking last week. So that, um, that is a, an opportunity to tie uh, Monterey County into the statewide system, uh, uh, eventually into high-speed rail. Initially, what we're looking at is funding two round trips per day, growing to six on the existing Union Pacific Corridor. We're working with them now uh, to hammer out how that's going to work. Uh, and then by the time that... Uh, uh, the first high-speed rail segment between Gilroy and San Francisco opens. Uh, what we're going to be looking at is a cross-platform seamless transfer at Gilroy, where uh, rather than being a train running from uh, a single train running from Salinas into San Francisco, uh, the opportunity then may be a um, a shuttle train to Salinas with a or, excuse me Gilroy cross-platform transfer, and then a much shorter uh, high-speed rail or electrified Caltrain trip up the rest of the corridor. But that plugs uh, Salinas and Monterey County and also Santa Cruz County uh, into that statewide rail network. That's the first, the first time we really plug into that um, uh, world-class high-speed transportation system. And then the future Monterey Bay network, once high-speed rail goes through the Pacheco Pass and down to LA, uh, will be connected to the, to the rest of the state uh, through that connection at Gilroy. Uh, all of a sudden trips um, you know, over the hill and, and, and into the valley uh, will shrink um, you know, by half or more. And then a third project, this is actually in Southern California, but I think it's very relevant to, to what we're talking about here in Santa Cruz, is uh, a project we're funding with San Bernardino CTA uh, they're, they're doing the Redlands Rail Project, also known as Aero, to extend uh, uh, from, I believe it's uh, San Bernardino Station to Redlands. It's, it's a short 10 mile or so extension with a few stations, uh, and, and they tie into the Metrolink commuter rail system at San Bernardino, where you can then head west into Los Angeles Union Station, and they're expanding it to a couple of great old walkable communities uh, in the Redlands area. They purchased three of these vehicles. This is a, a, a Stodler. It's a Swiss manufacturer that's been uh, incredibly successful in the last 15 years, is, is uh, constructing a new plant in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, and, and they have a concept for a diesel multiple unit that's been uh, used around the world um, where they have a, a power pack uh, in the middle of a two-car train set. The power pack is, is modular and convertible. Uh, what you see in the, the upper left is, is how if you wanted to have a very strong, you know, beefy uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Camaro version of the train, um, you could have four essentially bus engines put into each of the four bays in that power pack providing uh, good acceleration and, uh, and high maintained top speed. That's the model they've been looking at around the world. But they have been working with clients in, in, in the Netherlands, Switzerland, and other countries uh, where, where they're looking at opportunities to take that power pack and turn it into something much more efficient. Uh, and so we funded um, San Bernardino CTA uh, to buy one more of these train sets uh, and to do R&D and use it as a test base for new technology, uh, the, the zero emission uh, <coughs> multiple unit or the battery electric multiple unit. We're looking at battery electric, we're looking at hydrogen, and all of these things are, are, are products that Stadler is working with somewhere else in the world with other clients. The Maria Zellerbahn in Austria just contracted with them to do a hydrogen train. They're working with uh, Arriva, a private rail operator in the Netherlands, to use a, a, um, a, this concept on a train that has an overhead pan wire pantograph to run on electrified lines, and when it gets to the end of the lines and heads off to, uh, in, into the, the Netherlands of the Netherlands, <laughs> uh, then, then it can run on a diesel line with stored battery electric power. These things are, are either in operation or will be in operation in the next three to five years. And we're bringing that here to California with San Bernardino. And so as, as one of the speakers mentioned, um, by the time we have rail, op rail services operating uh, in Santa Cruz County, this will be uh, state of the art and, and operating technology. Uh, whisper quiet, um, zero emission, hydrogen battery electric, uh, 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 not your typical large lumbering diesel locomotive. That will not be the future for short branch lines uh, like Santa Cruz. 
in, in order to allow that to happen. Um, it, traditionally, uh, uh, in the U.S., we've been, been knocked for our approach to rail vehicle safety. Uh, uh, um, it is a very, it, it, it's not that it's not a safe way we've been approaching it, but traditionally we've been saying the idea is, is, is to be able to um, win the match when there's a crash and, and basically have the largest, safest, heaviest vehicle possible. And that drives down uh, uh, the performance on the uh, operating economic side. It drives down the performance on the environmental efficiency side when you have large pieces of steel moving around just trying to, to, to protect themselves during an event. The rest of the world has been switching toward a crash avoidance approach uh, where they use signal systems and technology to avoid crashes and then mitigate uh, it, when a crash does happen. I'm not going to say if, when it does happen, <laughs> uh, they use crash energy management and other approaches to, mi to minimize and mitigate the impact of that crash and, and enhance safety. So the industry has been working for uh, about a decade now on what they're calling alternative compliance, um, crash energy management, crumple zones, um, new technologies to ensure the safety of the driver and passengers in a crash in the less likely event that they occur in this crash avoidance uh, world. The FRA has worked with industry, with manufacturers, railroad operators uh, since, uh, like I said, around 2008 or so with the Federal Advisory Commission, uh, and they developed uh, standards that they agreed to in 2011 for crash energy management. Uh, about a week before the last presidential election, a notice of proposed rulemaking was published by the FRA, uh, which would basically create a final rule. Uh, then the president came in and said, we're going to slash two regulations for every one that we create. I'm not sure how the math works on you know, slashing quantities of regulations. Uh, and they've been sitting there trying to noodle on that for a while. But I've spoken with the FRA in the last month or so. And, and what they've mentioned is that they are going to promise an alternative compliance waiver to any agency that wants to follow those standards. And they do hope that that NPRM can turn into an actual rule uh, in this calendar year. So the path is cleared for this new approach to lighter weight, um, uh, 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 better performing rail vehicles in, this, in, in the country. Those vehicles will be smaller, lighter, and quieter. Uh, and, and just what manufacturers are doing today is providing a much more comfortable experience. With spacious interiors and large windows, we have eight or nine foot tall picture windows on these Stodler vehicles. It's, it's, it's quite an experience to ride in them. Um, the eBART extension, if you want to go ride a Stodler vehicle, is, is, uh, is running in the eBART. And, uh, and we're going to be looking at opportunities to provide passenger amenities that make your time more enjoyable on the train. It's already quite enjoyable, uh, but including cafes, bike storage, uh, and providing enhanced ADA accessibility. Not sure if Smart mentioned this, but I thought this was fantastic on their commuter line. Uh, the vendor that they went with uh, to provide the, the coffee and pastries on their train uh, is a local services group that provides uh, jobs for, uh, for handicapped individuals. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's a nonprofit, and I think it's just a wonderful model. Uh, to, they, they built the train, built the cafe into it, sought the vendor out later, and decided we've got a great approach to do this. We don't have to go to Aramark or a large corporation. We're going to keep it local, and we're going to give jobs to people who need them. So I just wanted to mention that was a great idea idea, in my opinion. Uh, and then uh, right-of-ways. Um, what we're looking at in the country, and I'm getting into the sort of bikes and trains uh, uh, um, nexus here, um, with these smaller vehicles, what you see on the left is a photograph of, of Austin, downtown Austin, Texas, uh, where they've been operating a Stodler vehicle for about seven or eight years now. Uh, and this is, this is one of the first ones in the country. And on the lower left, you see a two-way protected bicycle path, uh, and then the rail right-of-way, and in a city arterial street, just on the other side of those yellow uh, flex posts. Um, this is nothing new. Um, we've, been, we've been operating in constrained corridors with, with uh, rail, bike, uh, and, and cars uh, in spots throughout the country for a very long time. Uh, and, and so I think that this is something that, that uh, is, is a provable case. Uh, and then you look uh, at SMART, and if you talk to their par planner up there, Joanne Parker, she'll tell you she's not building a rail line, she's building a rail and trail. That's their, that is their mission and their, and their, their core goal. Uh, and, and they are doing that in, again, a, a very small constrained right of way uh, and, and creating a system that provides options for all users. If you need to get from Healdsburg to Larkspur, you're going to take the train. But if you need to get from Sonoma North to, to, or Santa Rosa North to Santa Rosa South and you'd rather just ride your bike, you've got both options now. Uh, and, and so I think that you have a lot of opportunities to bundle the corridors and provide all the trip options for those who want to take public transit or those who feel like taking a bike ride that day. I think there's certainly ample cases where that happens. And then uh, the lower right is a photograph in the Netherlands where what they're doing now is they're creating Snelfietsroute. It's uh, their term for a bicycle expressway, essentially. They're finding linear corridors between villages 10, 20 miles apart, 
and creating basically uh, uh, routes where cyclists do not have to yield to crossing traffic, um, uh, turning the stop signs, et cetera, and building high quality infrastructure uh, from town to town right along the rail line where you have 125 mile an hour electric trains operating uh, next to bicycles. And, <coughs> and you can choose which way you want to get around that day. <coughs> um, so, uh, Forgive me for the, the humor and, and digressing here. This is a presentation I gave to the California Bicycle Summit uh, last year, uh, and, and um, just wanted to kind of joke around about it. Bikes and trains, they go great together. Um, but you know, bikes, what are they good for? Well, they're great for commuting or exploring or recreating or saving the planet or riding to the Capitol Corridor to come to Watsonville. Um, and trains, well, what are they good for? Commuting, exploring, bringing us to recreation uh, and saving the planet, you know, little things like that as well. Uh, so they, they have a lot in common. Um, and, but what do we need to improve how they come together? And I think there's a couple of things. I apologize for the animations. Um, a, a, few, a few things, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, uh, and these are my, my boys uh, getting on the Capitol Corridor train in the upper right. Uh, they, we need a secure and sheltered place to store our bikes. We need to think about, uh, and not just a road bike, not just a 15-pound carbon fiber road bike, but that 60-pound Dutch family bike with two seats on it that's a little bit taller than the handlebars on a road bike. Uh, we need a place to put those bikes either on board the train or at the station and be sure that when we come back, it's going to be there. Uh, we need improved first and last mile access. We need safe and welcoming infrastructure, 8 to 80 infrastructure. I mean, I say 2 to, to 90 infrastructure. My boys were on bikes at six months, uh, and, and, and it's possible, um, but only when we have that safe infrastructure that makes a parent feel like this is a place where I can ride with my child. Uh, bike sharing, um, that is something that is growing enormously. Santa, I, I was shocked to see the jump bikes are in Santa Cruz. They, they rolled out in, in Sacramento in April or May, uh, and, and everyone in my office is, um, you know, I have a, a coworker who walks in on heels and says, I just rode to my mom's house for lunch. This thing is amazing. I never would have seen her on a bike in, in, in 100 years, and, and she's been riding it weekly uh, to go visit her mother uh, at lunchtime. And, and I think that that's just going to open the world to, to uh, people using bikes, um, uh, e-bikes, Bikes that you can get with a click of a, of a cell phone are really going to transform the way we get around. And then finally, rails with trails. Uh, this is not an either or opposition. It is not a train or a bike. It can be a train and a bike. It can be a train next to a bike path. It can be a bike on a train. It comes together in a million ways. These are all possible. Uh, so where can we look for inspiration? Again, the Netherlands is the obvious choice. They have 1.2 million rail trips per day. We're talking about that in 2040 in California with, with 40 million residents. They do it with 20 million residents today. 40% of the passengers in the Netherlands reach their station by bike every day. Another 15% reach their final destination by bike. Either they're storing their own second bike at the station at the other end, or maybe they're using the, the railroad-owned bike share system, but, but they're using an awful lot of bikes. Um, the state uh, rail infrastructure man, uh, provider uh, manages today 520,000 bike parking spaces, and they're growing that to 600,000 by 2030. These are um, fantastic facilities. A, a small town with 1,000 covered bike parking spaces, or you've got a Rotterdam station with a, a three-level subterranean ride-in, ride-out uh, bike parking facility so that you can ride your bike, park it, walk up the steps to the train platform. Uh, and as I mentioned, they have this nationwide uh, bike sharing system. If we applied those rates of bicycle use, bike to train use to California with our uh, uh, 2040 rail ridership goal, we'd have over 715,000 new bike trips to and from rail per day in 2040. And just think what that does to greenhouse gas emissions. And we also have better weather than the Netherlands. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but, but, you know, it's not just the Netherlands. We are doing great things here in California. Caltrain's explosive growth has been fueled by bike access. Uh, they, they have Serious bike problems on board that they are writing special plans just, just to address those. The Capital Corridor has been pulling out all the stops to make sure that biking uh, to the train is, is an easy decision. They now carry about 11 to 12 percent of their passengers arriving and departing by bike. That's, that's getting to Dutch standards in a way. Um, Smart's rail and trail concept I think is a model for other rail systems in California and nationwide. SB1 is also going to infuse $100 million into, active trans into the active transportation program across the state every year. Uh, those are opportunities. I think we should begin at rail stations, at the synergy of, of, of rail and bike. Uh, bike link lockers and secure biking fa parking facilities are rolling out across Northern California, and bike share systems are expanding literally weekly. Every new city I go to, you're going to see those, those red bikes. Um, this was Smart's very first week of operations, and they were carrying on some, uh, some days uh, over 200 bikes. Uh, and this was the week when, uh, when before they had a normal day. Uh, and so moving forward, 
Looking at, at uh, Caltrans, we have a, a strategic management plan has a very ambitious goal. It's, 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 a, it's a reach goal, stretch goal. Triple, double, double. It's the idea of tripling uh, uh, transit and rail ridership. I'm sorry, tripling biking, doubling transit and rail, and doubling walking trips in the state of California, uh, a reach goal. Um, what they don't have in there is the rail trips themselves. And we're looking at an 11-fold increase. According to Google, the word for 11-fold is non-decouple. So I call it the triple, double, double, non-decouple. If we grow 11-fold on the rail side, that's how we're going to help get transit, walking, and biking to their triple, double, double goals. I think that's something we can latch on to, so just food for thought. Uh, we're doing a lot of great, uh, uh, we, we need to be doing more first mile, last mile planning for bike ped access to rail and transit systems. Um, support opportunities to share the linear right of way that railroads provide uh, for, and share that with uh, bike and pedestrian paths. Support bike parking needs at stations uh, and define appropriate bicycle accommodation policies. It's not just a couple of U racks outside the station anymore. It needs to be something that makes people really comfortable leaving their bike at the station. Um, supporting seamless integration of bike share and public transit fare systems on a regional and even statewide scale. So that my, you know, today, Uber, I can choose. Do I want an Uber car or do I want a bike share? Um, hopefully in the future we'll have an app that says, and tie that, tie that BART trip in there as well, or the Santa Cruz Metro trip as well. Uh, and, and at Caltrans, we can provide technical assistance and grants for station area plans and creating 8 to 80 networks uh, throughout the state. Uh, a few more examples of these fantastic bike parking garages in the Netherlands. This is a, a, a beautiful bridge that they created across a, a, a canal in the Netherlands with 125 mile hour trains with a cantilevered uh, 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 bike path off the edge of this uh, steel structure you see it in the lower left. Um, Stockholm, Sweden in the upper left, uh, again, a four track busy main line. Uh, with a bike pedestrian path next to it. And in the lower right, uh, we, we see the steel bridge in Portland, Oregon. Uh, a double deck lift bridge owned by the Union Pacific Railroad carries uh, TriMet light rail vehicles and city traffic on the upper level, carries Amtrak and Union Pacific freight on the lower level. And TriMet said, can we tack on a, a, a bike and pedestrian path to, you don't ask things like that of Union Pacific Railroad lightly. Um, again, this is, a, this is a lift bridge. Balance is incredibly important, especially when you're trying to match up uh, uh, miter joints on train tracks, miter joints on light rail tracks, catenary systems for light rail, and ensure that cars aren't having a bumpy ride over the top. So any, any rock or pebble you add that creates an imbalance uh, is going to make that bridge fail. Um, Union Pacific and, this, and TriMet got together and made it work that they added on a, an aluminum uh, bike and pedestrian path on the side, rebalanced the bridge, worked on the safety concerns, uh, and made it happen. So just more proof that, that um, bikes and trains really do go together. And if you're willing to make it work, there's, there's always a way. And then I'll just conclude with the idea of, of um, statewide integrated mobility. This goes back to the, the ticketing uh, thing that I was talking about, this creating a seamless user experience. Today, our inner city rail services pay around 20% to Amtrak uh, to support ticketing and reservations. 20 cents of every dollar they earn goes back to selling the next ticket. Globally, there are um, European railroads are paying 10 to 15 percent a decade ago or more. Uh, we've spoken with uh, uh, Deutsche Bahn, the German company, which is the early train operator for high-speed rail. They say through technology and other enhancements and, and, and sharing their platform with other mobility providers in, in, in Germany, they have that down to about 4 percent now. The Swedes had, had started a similar process uh, about 20 years ago to unify uh, public transit operators, the private rail operators, uh, and, and others into a, a nationwide system. It's about 100 companies today that, that, that are part of a nonprofit agency that shares the statewide travel planning and ticketing, and they've, they are about to drop the cost of uh, the, their share of revenue collection down to 1%. Uh, that is not only going to significantly improve the bottom line for transit operators, but it's also going it, to, what they're doing is they're creating a platform that makes it easier for riders to choose to take transit when they can go into an app and say, I want to go from Reading to, to Watsonville and figure that out without having to go to six web pages and fuddle for, around for quarters in cash. Uh, and so the state rail plan and, and the statewide transit strategic plan, another document that we're working on, sort of a policy strategy document, are going to emphasize the coordination of rail and transit services to create a fast, frequent, and reliable mobility network across California. And we're all going to be more successful, I believe, if we can all sell tickets to places beyond where our transit agencies go alone. Uh, we're going to provide comprehensive, dynamic travel planning information, coordinated fares, these are not going to be easy things, and a single payment mechanism across all rail and transit services in California. This is our goal. The state. It may be the state leading it, it may be private sector leading it, it may be a few transit agencies leading it, but we, we think 
this is where we need to go uh, in order to draw more riders into our system. We're going to bring in TNCs, Uber, Lyft, uh, and others, and, and try to create a platform that all can share from. And we think we can do all this and save money in the process. So we, uh, at the, the state, we have put together a group, um, a program, a project called the Integrated Travel Project. We hosted an event in Davis in early May where we brought in guest speakers uh, from around the world, from the Netherlands, uh, the UK, Norway, um, Switzerland, uh, and Sweden, and, and, and Hong Kong, and said, how are you doing this? Um, is this something we should pursue? We had uh, uh, speakers from uh, BART, LA Metro, um, San Joaquin RTD, across the state, and, and the consensus was, yes, we should be doing something. We don't know what it is. We're not trying to be prescriptive. Um, but what we've done is we have uh, uh, used the TIRCP program to fund uh, an effort to dig deeper into this, to get really into the nuts and bolts of, of that governance. And, uh, and, and hopefully in a few years, we'll have a pilot project. And in, in seven or eight years, we'll have something functioning statewide that every Californian has as the first app in their phone or, or, or uh, the first website they have on their, their browser tab. So I believe... I've taken enough of your time, and I will, and I'm sure there's questions, so I will leave it there. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Kyle, thank you for that very thorough presentation. Let me see if there's any questions, commissioners. Commissioner Rockin. Um, of, of course, there are unknowns in terms of whether we'll be in a recession and how deep it will be, and whether SB one will be repealed. Hopefully not, but. Even with those unknowns, is there, can you give us some order of magnitude idea of what additional funds would be uh, necessary to meet this plan's goals by uh, 2040? Are we going to need an additional uh, revenue source, like another SB1, or gas tax increases, or something else? Or is this fundable with the current, if we don't have a deep recession and SB1 doesn't get repealed, is this plan funded? Um, I haven't done the math on whether we have enough, but, but SB1 uh, and greenhouse gas uh, cap and trade is, is certainly a um, helpful and significant contribution to what we're trying to get to here. Uh, you know, high-speed rail itself has its own uh, uh, needs and targets for funding. Um, they have, you know, if you hear Brian Kelly speak, I, I believe he says that they, they have, uh, a, a, I, won't, I will not quote him, but a certain amount, a quarter or a third of the money that they need to, to build, they actually do have commitments and agreements to. Uh, it's, it's getting to that remainder um, that's going to be tricky for them. And on the high-speed rail side, we're looking at, at, at an operation that should be profitable. And so the question has always been about private sector participation. I really do believe that once we have that system, that once the public has, has built the system, that operators will be able to create revenue and, and, and profit and return. And so I think the private investment will come in at the end on, on the high-speed rail side. The rest of the network, uh, I think that we'll be able to drive down costs and on the operating side significantly. The capital will be a major investment, but I think we'll be able to drive down operating costs and therefore be able to, to cover uh, maintenance and operations and a lot of the pieces of this future network. That said, capital is a big thing, uh, a big, big part of the problem. Um, SB1 and greenhouse gas cap and trade are, 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 are going to get us a lot of the way there if they remain steady. Um, if SB1 stays, uh, that will be incredibly helpful. Um, there are also initiatives such as uh, you know self-help counties can do an awful lot uh, uh, measure uh, what's the measure in, in los angeles you know 120 billion dollars or so is a fantastic leveraging point uh, tircp gave metrolink uh, over 800 million dollars to build a regional rail network leveraging that off of a lot of the self-help money from la county uh, and so i think there will be opportunities there the federal government uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say that there's ever a trend in the federal government, but this year uh, a lot of the uh, federal rail money has been shaken loose. They're, uh, they're in a third round of capital funding uh, uh, right now, but that's $300 million to the entire country. And we have, through SB1, $750 million for California alone. But that'll be helpful. And, and, and what we've done is we've created, through our own state funding, the opportunity to go in and leverage those federal dollars. The feds like to say, um, we want to see you leverage our money. Well, it's kind of like California saying, thanks, feds, we're going to leverage our money with you now. Um, so, you know, the calculation of what's needed, what's, what's that difference um, that, that, that's out there, uh, I, I don't have that number for you, but I think we're, we're really moving well in a way to start getting these initial investments to building this network. I mean, just to follow up, it, it wouldn't be an argument against it that it's not fully funded at the current moment. If, um, that's not my point. But I'm trying to get some sense of the order of magnitude, again, on the 
uh, either the operating or the capital, or in fact, on, on both sides, trying to get a at least order of magnitude sense of whether, I mean, could, for example, I mean, if people took the money they're spending on their private cars now and that we spend on parking and streets and things uh, in terms of public money, you could operate a lot of public systems for a lot less money if you actually began to make that shift and people were willing to go there. But I'm just trying to get some sense of whether this is only the sort of startup money to make this happen that's available and we're really going to have to go back and make a major shift in funding sources or whether the current funding is halfway there or something. Again, when I say order of magnitude, and to get, and I, your answer didn't give me a really good sense of that yet. And so maybe you could tell me a little more about what your sense of, you know, realistically, whether we're going to need additional funding sources from the federal government or from California and somewhere to make this, um, the, the 2040 plan actually come, become real. I don't want to speak about my pay grade here, uh, but but one 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 way to think about it is is that if you look at the investment plan in the state in the state rail plan, uh, and I, I don't have the number off the top of my head, uh, uh, it's it's over a hundred billion dollars for the system, but if you look at that investment by 2040, that total on the rail and transit side is about three percent of total transportation spending that will take place in California by 2040 That's when you count yeah. local, uh, statewide, and 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 private investment in the system. And if you think about it that way, that we can get all of this, we can get a, a go from a third of a percent of passenger miles traveled to 7% for 3% of the total transportation spending over the next 22 years. To me, that sounds like a pretty darn good proposition. Uh, and, and so I'm hoping that I think we, it, we need to be strong out of the gate. We need to deliver on these early projects. We need to start making improvements so that people begin to see the value of the projects and this seamless integration so that we are bringing people onto the rail system. If, if it's not working, if, if we get out five, 10 years down the road and it's not getting the, <coughs> the, the, the predicted uh, uh, ridership and, and revenue and, and mode shift uh, that we're looking at, uh, it's gonna be a very hard sell to get that, you know, the, the, the remaining 70% of it built. So I, I, I like that number. The 3% of total transportation spending uh, is, is a pretty good number for those benefits, in my opinion. Thank you. Mr. Caput. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, one concern I have is, uh, in general, is uh, uh, CO2 emissions and how it puts stress on all of our uh, ecosystem and everything and on us. And, uh, how, how do they measure tons? Uh, I probably could look that up, but anyway, you're here, so I maybe you have the answer, or somebody has the answer. It says so many tons of uh, uh, CO2 emissions. Is that the actual particles that they're able to somehow calculate uh, that, uh, you know, maybe through a filter and then how much, if they put it all together, back together? I'm here, so I'll pass the buck. No, <laughs> uh, but right. Uh, that, that is certainly a question for the Air Resources Board. We work with them when we evaluate the TIRCP applications. Um, you know, we, we it, it's a tailpipe emission uh, calculation. Uh, uh, so, so I'm not sure if that's what's coming out of the tailpipe or how it then interacts with other gases in the atmosphere. I'm, I, I, I did very poorly in, in physical sciences, um, but ARB has 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 the calculations for, sure. for and then that. The, like uh, uh, the big redwoods, uh, they're probably, well, they are the biggest uh, uh, filters of uh, CO2 uh, in the world, <laughs> actually. That, I don't know, uh, Jack Nelson, uh, maybe uh, you got the, you, do you have the answer? I mean, I will say that <laughs> the gas itself has, the <laughs> gas itself has, a, has, it. has a weight. And sure. so that's what they're uh, measuring is how much the gas itself actually weighs, even though, you know, to your, your eye or something, you don't think, you know, what's coming out of the tailpipe is anything that you could weigh or measure. That's exactly what's being measured is how much does that gas actually. Yeah. Let, yeah. Let, let's yeah. try not to go out to the audience for questions. We'll allow this one right here, but let's try answer. to get commissioner questions. Go ahead, Mr. Nelson. Here. So commissioner Caput, uh, and just very briefly, there are carbon dioxide molecules zipping around in a gaseous state in this room right now. We're all breathing them in and out. And uh, so those are atoms and molecules that actually have mass. So a volume of gas has a weight to it. So that's, that's the weight we're talking about. So for instance, if you get in an average emissions car in the United States right now, uh, you drive one mile, you've emitted one pound of carbon dioxide. Uh, you know, another way to think of it that, I, that concerns me, it's like rolling down your window every mile and throwing out a bag of garbage, except for this stays in the atmosphere and drives global warming. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that short consensus. Thank you very much. 
So, so knowing that now, <laughs> the calculations for, for TIRCP, we do, we do have many factors, but uh, we, we, we calculate the emissions reduction uh, per dollar spent, and that's how we then sure. evaluate the, the uh, awarded project. Thank you. Commissioner Leopold. Uh, the, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. G uh, Gradinger, for your presentation. It, it's, you packed a lot in in a short period of time, and I appreciate your personal commitment uh, as well. It's, it's, it's good to serve as a role model, and, the, and I know I've taken that the bus to the train and, uh, and the train up to Sacramento quite a bit. Um, I've never come all the way down here to Watsonville, but I'll, I'm going to – maybe I'll have to add that onto my uh, Rest of credit. Uh, trip. <laughs> um, so the, you, there were a lot of good information uh, that you shared with us, and I won't get to all of it because uh, uh, I'm sure we could spend all day talking about it. You talked about the future of reducing cost per mile um, uh, and the trends with that. Uh, Beyond just more people using it, is there any other thing that you think is, is, is driving that? There's a number of factors. Um, uh, top of my head is just these uh, more efficient rail vehicles. Uh, uh, the, the, the gold standard being, you know, perhaps a battery electric uh, ZEMU. Uh, but we're, we're making progress now uh, with um, the new charger locomotives, which are, we're putting into service across the state with um, San Joaquin's Capital Corridor and, and next week in L.A. Um, those are... Um, uh, tier four uh, diesel locomotives uh, with with a lower fuel burn. We're working with uh, Capital Quarters, working on a renewable diesel program, uh, and so they're able to hedge fuel costs. And so there's some, there's reduced fuel consumption uh, uh, savings there. Um, life cycle costs for maintenance of these new vehicles, uh, 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 designed and engineered, uh, you know, with with quality. <laughs> We're hoping we can uh, reduce the life cycle maintenance costs significantly on these new locomotives. Um, on the operating side, there are uh, a number of things that we can be doing to reduce costs. Uh, um, uh, traditionally in the United States, um, the, the contractor is uh, uh, Amtrak. Um, Amtrak is a great partner. Um, we are also looking at opportunities to, to find other operators. Uh, there are many out there who, who would like to run these services. That happens a lot on the, on the uh, uh, commuter rail side. Caltrain has a very successful, uh, uh, ha has been reducing costs and providing great service significantly with uh, a, a private contractor. Um, <coughs> Altima Commuter Express has been doing that as well. So there's opportunities to, to look at, at uh, who your contractor is and what your cost to provide that service is. We're also in a situation nationwide with Amtrak, uh, where um, today, again, our inner city operations are provided by Amtrak. Since uh, 2008, the Passenger Rail Investment and Improvement Act uh, took place. That changed the relationship uh, between states and, and Amtrak. So states where corridors that are less than 750 miles are operated, they took on the cost responsibility for providing those services starting in, in uh, uh, I think, the act was 2008, and, and, and that happened around 2012 or 2013, 14. Um, we now have line item costs in our contract from Amtrak for everything on the train, uh, uh, onboard Wi-Fi, um, coffee service, <laughs> conductors per car, things like that. Um, we know a lot more about where the costs are coming from, and so the, the JPAs and, uh, and, and those who are directly operating the service can work with the state to identify opportunities to reduce those costs. So, so there's, there's onboard, there's operational uh, costs, there are equipment costs, um, and, and then as we get to this sort of um, uh, future state where we're just operating more efficiently, where, where we don't have trains running from one end of the line to the other and laying over for eight hours, if we press it back into service, we're getting more dollars out of that capital, more revenue. So, um, so just smarter operations as well. So the future does not look like my grandfather's railroad. It's a it's a it's a, it's a very different. Uh, Unless your grandfather's railroad is in Pennsylvania, um, yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, my grandfather different. is in Pennsylvania. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> we ran them very well in the 30s and 40s, <laughs> and it's been rough since then. Um, you mentioned that the state is spending about three percent of its transportation funding for um, uh, for rail, um, and although that sounds like a small number, you, you've pointed out that it's. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, in these uh, rail funding programs that you talked about, um, are there going to be planning funds, capital uh, funds, um, uh, funding for the, 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 the nice uh, Swedish, uh, I think it was Swedish, not Switzerland, Swedish? I was getting confused. Uh, um, uh, where the bus trains work together. I mean, that seems to be uh, critical. Uh, but will the will the state uh, funding programs help support those kind of activities? Yes. Um, first of all, uh, on the three percent number, that that is of uh, the projected 
capital cost for delivering this this rail vision, um, we think the the that cost is about three percent of all the capital dollars that we spent till twenty forty. I don't know the number of what percent of the state transportation budget today is going into rail. I don't know if that's less or more than 3%. Um, just want to clarify that. Um, yes, there, there will be uh, planning opportunities. There are, uh, in, in the TIRCP awards, as I mentioned, we gave the network integration dollars to some of the agencies. Uh -huh. TAMSI uh, received a little bit of network integration money. Uh, uh, and so we can look at things like um, um, cross-platform transfers, coordination at Pajaro with the, with the Santa Cruz branch line, things like that. Um, there are other, um, you know, I believe Santa Clara has has a, a self-help uh, uh, source as well that uh, uh, we can leverage that certainly on planning funding. There are um, uh, uh, sustainable communities planning grants. Uh, there are all the traditional planning sources. We want to we want to help um, our partners bring those into the rail side, into the rail planning side, uh, and we are working at the state to partner. Uh, we did we've created a Northern California mega regional rail working group, uh, which is the rail operators, SMART, uh, Capital Corridor, ACE, San Joaquin, Caltrain, and now TAMC, uh, where we're getting together and, and Caltrain, or Caltrans is using some of its uh, internal planning dollars with our partners now, and we're, we're investing in new tools uh, to help us do this planning. And so we want to try to do a lot of that in-house uh, rather than going out to consultants um, as much as we can. But as the money is identified, we want to expand that work and create the foundation, create the principles for planning, the principles for timetabling, uh, scheduling, and then begin to, to uh, do the further planning that gets into implementation. No, I appreciate it. And the statewide plan, and I'm just thinking about our, the local needs because I think it serves as a, um, if, if we chose that route, we'd, we'd want to use the, the uh, sort of best practices in order to increase uh, participation and ridership. Okay. That's a great question. I, I, I don't know the exact sources. I don't have a list on my top of my head, but I will bring that question back, and I'd be glad to, if you want to reach out to me, I'll try to get sure. sources. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can get it back to uh, Mr. Dondero. That would be fantastic. Um, you talked about the congested corridors uh, funding uh, stream as well for multimodal. You know, uh, one of the things that we're contemplating here is looking at both our rail and our trail. So the, the, that combination, does that make us more competitive? Or uh, if we only chose one mode, would it make us less competitive? Um, I don't want to speak to what is competitive and what isn't, but I think I think it's certainly the kind of thing that that program was, the legislation uh, would probably say this is the kind of corridor we should be investing in. Uh, you know, it, 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 the idea, very roughly speaking, was was how do we um, add capacity in a corridor without adding single occupant vehicle uh, lanes? Um, you know, it, it was looking at um, express lanes, hot lanes, rail, um, transit, how that program has been defined in the first round. Um, um, you know, is probably going to be looked at again. So I think providing feedback on future guidelines for the congested corridors program is an opportunity to make sure that, that projects like yours are considered. Great. Um, you mentioned something, uh, that you showed some uh, statistics about bike use and the smart train. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the, uh, uh, the general manager and uh, the head of the tr transportation agency uh, here just two weeks ago, uh, gave a great presentation. And we didn't really get into th this uh, very deeply. Um, but uh, it was my understanding, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, is that they built a lot of bike lockers, but they found that people weren't using the, as many bike lockers as they wanted space on the train so they could do their first and last mile on both ends. Has that something that you see in other places? Um, or is that even correct? Yeah, yeah, that is, uh, and and uh, it's we need an all of the above strategy. We need bike lockers. We need capacity on on trains. We need bike share systems. Um, if you look at the Netherlands, they don't allow bikes on trains on a lot of their peak hour trains, uh, and so they they and yet that's the main way people get around once they're not on a train. And so that second bike or that bike sharing system is playing a very important role. Uh, uh, along with a nice place to park that second bike. Yeah. Capital Corridor struggles with this. They've been struggling with it for many years now. Uh, they have, as I said, around 11 or 12 percent uh, bike access. They have, uh, we cannot build enough uh, uh, bike racks in their trains for some of their peak hour trains. We have, we have uh, the capacity for, I think, 17 bikes in the cab car and three more in every other train, and they are oversubscribed. So, you know, more than 30 people on most segments of their peak hour trains. 
So Capital Corridor is looking at rolling out the bike link lockers. Uh, um, uh, the bike share systems, I think, are going to be really helpful, That giving people the opportunity to just leave their bike at home and hop on a bike share bike and leave it at the station and forget about it uh, is going to be very helpful. Um, the other thing is, is there's just regional... Um, peculiarities in play. I think in, in, in Sonoma and Marin, you've got a lot of those those road bikers who maybe want to get out to the countryside on the train and they want to bring their you know carbon fiber racing bike with them. They're not going to leave that <laughs> and ride something at the end. So everything is going to be a unique experience and that's why it needs to be an all of the above solution. Um, but bike parking is, is a fairly easy thing to, to do. Um, the biggest hurdles are local permitting uh, and finding the space. Sure. Yeah. Um, the the last question I'll ask, as I said, there's lots of, lots to of talk about. But you, you talked about what future train engines l l look like. If you were you showed us the San Bernardino, uh, uh, what they're using, which is a primarily electric vehicle. It seems like it, it, it looks like it could be battery electric or hydrogen. We're still exploring yeah, that. Yeah, um, and they're quieter. Um, uh, and looking at that picture, it was hard to tell whether they were going. It was low enough to require stations, or whether they were going to be able to just have people walk on. Do you have some sense about that? That that particular vehicle uh, has about a 20-inch floor height, uh, and and so. Um, uh, we could do low-level platforms essentially and provide right. an ADA accessible entrance into it. And and we're talk we're having a discussion all the time about whether we can standardize around a, a high-level and a low-level uh, rail car boarding height in right. the state. Uh, it's an issue that just needs to get. We need to kind of wrap it up. Um, but I think that that uh, globally, if you look at at uh, where these vehicles are are being designed originally is in Europe, where they have a far worse uh, um, situation in terms of a unifying standard for boarding heights. Um, they have really elected to go toward lower boarding heights, but they still have 15 inch, 18 inch, 22 inch um, that they're dealing with. But I think that in general, the vehicles could, for lines like the regional networks we're talking about in the Monterey Bay area, I think that a low floor boarding, level boarding um, to a poured concrete, you know, 18 or 20 inch platform is probably a very feasible uh, solution. It's not, it doesn't have to be a 48 inch high right. affair like Smart has. Right. Well, as a, speaking as a transit board member, I know that staff, our staff is working on giving you an option to pay for your 69W trip Thank you. uh, or your Highway 17 trip on an app. Uh, we're, we're, it's, it's, it's not immediate, but, we're, but, the, but the staff is working on it. We recognize that that's how people uh, uh, want to uh, pay for their uh, transit travel. So uh, maybe sometime soon you'll be able to come down here and just use your phone. Thank you. so. and, and the Wi-Fi on the 17X bus worked really well. So. Excellent. Good to hear. <laughs> thank you. Safe store. Stay data. I'll, I'll start at the far end down here. Work away. Commissioner Johnson. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, welcome. Thank you. You strike me as kind of the half glass, half full kind of guy. It's sanguine, positive. Um, and actually, I think the population of California is, is that way. I'm proud of the fact that people regularly will... Uh, tax themselves, and I think the high-speed rail tax some 15 years ago was a good evidence of that. Um, people were confident that something like that would really pan out. But I'm looking at uh, just, I think, yesterday's uh, Orange County Register saying it's time to pull the plug on high-speed rail because of all the problems that you're having, starting with $30 billion promise, and now uh, projected possibly to go to $100 billion. So on the one hand, um, I'm, you know, nobody wants to throw cold water on plans like these, but the taxpayers uh, pay attention. And I think uh, we're finding that uh, they're losing a little bit of patience with things like high-speed rail. And you keep referencing that the high-speed rail is part of these plans that we see up here uh, that uh, things are going to work out, but at the same time, we've seen a, a massive delays, huge o uh, cost overruns, and and cost overruns aren't just particular for high-speed rail. You find that most rail projects uh, double uh, in terms of the costs that are uh, originally projected. Um, you talk about uh, you know rail offers uh, reliability and convenience. But that's not quite true in some ways, okay? You got here, and I, again, I, I'm not bringing it up, but you did say that you got here via rail, bus, and, and whatever. Um, to get here in a car probably would have taken you two and a half hours. How long did it take for you to get here, 
using all those modes. Was it five or six? It was or five, yeah. Yeah, yep. okay. So um, even though in this room right here, people talk about all the benefits of how great it is to bike, how great it is to take uh, trains and buses and so forth, uh, people vote with their feet and with their cars and with their transportation modality. And most people say, it isn't convenient enough for me to change my method of transportation. So um, I just want to, um, on the one hand, I think places like BART, Caltrans, um, I forget the name of the train that goes from, say, uh, in the San Diego corridor, which is filled and, and does a terrific job. Uh, there are plenty of, plenty of places where, where transportation with rail works beautifully, and investment to those populated corridors should be really, really expanded. Um, but I notice most of your examples uh, use places like Switzerland, you know, that has 15,000 square miles, not 165,000 like we, like we have in California, with a population density that is four, five, six times more than we have in California. So on the one hand, your presentation, impressive, I like it. But on the other hand, you know, the, the taxpayers have a way of evaluating and being critical. And I would caution you just not to throw out things that eventually uh, will fly in the face of what the taxpayers' expectations are and, and what the deliverables are. I mean, that was your word, the deliverables. Unless we, quote, deliver, then we're going to lose credibility. And high-speed rail, the bullet train has lost a lot of credibility, but some people are just hanging on tenaciously, and, and I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but you sound like one of them, that we're going to hold on to this high-speed rail thing when editorial boards, taxpayers, uh, I think even um, uh, Lieutenant Governor Newsom has kind of backed off saying, I, I don't know if I support this, much like he didn't uh, support the Trans Bay Center that got built. Um, so, again, I don't want to throw cold water on, but I think the, I think the, the taxpayers have to be represented, and um, I'm just uh, throwing that out there. Thank you. No, I appreciate all that, and, and, and you're right. Like I said, we, we do need to, we need to show the benefits of what we're doing, and, and we need to show that we're, we're changing the dynamic of how we uh, deliver the rail system and what service we deliver, and we have to do that quickly or we will run out of political capital to do that. Uh, uh, and I think one of the things that's interesting is, is we talk about private investment. Well, I, th I think we're getting to the point now in California where we are having uh, 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 network rail from England, SBB, the Swiss rail operator, Deutsche Bahn's consulting group. Um, they, are, they are growing their presence uh, in California because I think that they see the opportunity to do what they've done here and they, and they know that there's a role for them to play. So I think that even, even if it hasn't happened yet, laying out the vision saying that this is where we want to go is attracting the attention of those who have done it. And I think that by combining their expertise and experience with our uh, willingness is our best chance to get it done. It may not happen. It, it very certainly could not happen. Um, but but the, the alternative uh, is something that, you know, congested roadways that cannot be expanded uh, will only get worse. And so I think the rail plan really focuses on, you know, high-speed rail is the spine that will tie together a lot of the benefits, but the, region, the, the state rail plan really looks at these regional networks that are going to help people every day. Uh, and, and I think that that is something that we, that we, we have to invest in or uh, we will hit a wall when I mean, we've hit the wall uh, in congestion. But I agree, uh, it, it's not a guarantee. We've got to do it differently than we've done it in the past if we want to be successful. Thank you. Commissioner Chase. Yeah, I just want to thank you for your presentation. It was great when you were here last time. I think your enthusiasm is really um, real and important and necessary because this is exciting, what we're talking about. I think one of the things that's sort of related to the points that Commissioner Johnson made is um, are being constrained around the development of technology because while there's really great things on the horizon, for instance, those of us who are on the Metro board, 
um, we are waiting excruciatingly long for what we're very excited about, which are electric buses. But we can only go as fast as the buses are being developed. And the development of that changes all the time. I, I personally am leasing a, an electric vehicle because I know that the batteries in electric vehicles are changing as we speak. And in a couple of years when that lease is up, I'll get a different electric vehicle that's even better and goes farther and, and, and more energy efficient. So I think that that has to be really talked about too, because that is one of the challenges to the exciting parts of the multimodal system you just outlined is the costs and benefits of a very rapidly changing technology, which also changes the cost of that, and then also the infrastructure. And so I'm not sure that everybody fully appreciates the complexity of that when we're talking about such uh, combining all these different modes and making them work and making them work within existing infrastructure that doesn't really support that. So there's my comments. Thank you. Yeah. And, and we're, we're working with uh, PG&E and some of the utilities are now coming to us and saying we, have, we, we want to spend money. We have to spend money, settlement money, but we want to help be a part of this. And, 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 uh, and we know with our toe in the water, it's not going to be easy, but we certainly, and ARB is saying all electric by 2030. And I know CTA is, is uh, doing a great job working for you all to say, let's figure out how to make it happen, and we'll work with you. Good morning, and welcome, and thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, some of the questions have already been asked that were on my mind, but I, I wanted to just mix and match the numbers, and there were a lot of them, and understandably so, but I, I, did you say to, that today that uh, uh, in the integrated system, there's 120,000 trips in California now, and the target is to get to 1.3, and does that equal the getting to 7 percent? Is that or is that correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. And 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 I, I'll have to get back to you on on the 7 percent. We're we're finalizing some numbers, whether that is trips or passenger miles traveled. Um, but I believe that number was trips. One point. Yeah, I, I just to 1 .3. we have a nightmare here on Highway One, and I just wonder what percentage of of those uh, single uh, passenger vehicles, if they were uh, if there were two people in, what, t 10 or 20 percent of them, that's probably not for you to answer, but would that alleviate our problem if we can get people to, to ride share and all that? Uh, you know, I just, uh, I don't know, I, I'd, I'd be interested in those kind of figures from our own, uh, but uh, do you, uh, for, when you have a nightmare like this, and I guess it depends on how many lanes of travel there are, two or four or six or whatever, but uh, when, is there any, uh, uh, criteria that says if we can reduce that single car, uh, single driver to two or three people in a car, this will alleviate the, the situation. Um, is there any kind of a data that ha has that kind of a, um, well, result, I guess? It, it, know, it's certainly a part of the solution. It, it can't hurt to, to, to try to do that. Um, I, I, I would look to the hot lane experiences that are, you know, um, San Mateo is working on it. The Northern Virginia area has been doing hot lanes uh, and trying to drive up the, the the number of passengers per vehicle through pricing. Um, but but uh, it's certainly an approach that I mean, more people per car is going to help. And in the last the the last mile, uh, the, the assumption is always that people would walk or or ride a bike to for that last mile, uh, not because you'd have a if you were going to use the integrated system and they want to drive their car to the station, that, that creates some real uh, planning um, concerns. Uh, does that, how does that mix with what you're presenting to? I, I think we're heading into a really good future there because, yes, we want to get as many of those trips on, on, on feet and bikes as possible, but um, that's not reality. It's, it, it's a very small portion. Um, but people will, you know, automobile will be the dominant access mode in most places for a very long time. But with TNCs, with Lyft and Uber, um, the mm -hmm. thing that that does is you got to deal with the congestion st still. They're, they're going to they're create local traffic congestion, but that drives down the demand for very expensive and difficult to build parking. And I think that's the, the silver lining um, with, with the fact that even if 85% of people still come in a, in a, in a motor vehicle, um, it, that motor vehicle is going to get out of there and go pick up someone else. Uh, a big chunk of those trips, I think, are going to become... Uh, Lyft and Uber, and and we're we don't see the TNCs as competition to the rail mode. We see them as complementary, uh, and and figuring out what the role of rail is and what the role of those first last mile providers are. We'll, we'll balance out over time, um, but but I think that there's the big benefit is if if 
Uber and Lyft are used for those short trips, those access trips, and Rails used for those line haul long distance trips. Um, at least economic, the ac economic mind in me is saying that's the ideal, and I think that's where the market may go, and it reduce, reduces the need for expensive parking. Great, thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> Commissioner Bertrand. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk a, bit, a little bit about uh, bike storage, either end, and um, a little bit about technology. A lot of people talk about technology, but I have a different uh, direction. Um, so I commuted on the SB from San Francisco to Silicon Valley for multiple years, and it took me about a year to get a bike storage thing. So I took my car to the station, Fourth and Townsend, and then I had a walk. Um, many of my passengers would actually talk about joining together to get a, a junky car in Sunnyvale, and then that's how they got to work. So we've gone a long ways, and um, the SB couldn't allow me, or wouldn't allow me, rather, to bring my bike on board, which would have been great. Um, can you comment on the effect of bicycle riders or commuters by the placement of more bike storage units at a station? I don't have uh, numbers for general use, but from my own personal experience, I think that what the, like you said, you would sign up for a bike parking locker. And Took maybe, forever. Yeah. You m some people never get off the list. Uh, this this current uh, technology, the, the the bike link lockers. Uh, unfortunately, my, my wallet is so thick with these cards, I'm going to have a spinal condition soon. But um, the the bike link locker allows public access. You know, you wait three days in the mail for this to come through, and then I can use any available open locker. I don't have to sign up for a three year list for that one spot that then only one person ever gets to use. It's kind of parking sharing, uh, and I think that that is is making bike parking more efficient and more equitable right now. Uh, and so that's going to be a big part of it. Um, cities are also looking at bike garages, you know, sort of, uh, we call them special parking areas, bike spas in Sacramento, <laughs> uh, you know, a, a, a maybe even a valet or a staffed uh, nice facility. There's, again, like I mentioned with, with um, peculiarities between systems, there are a lot of solutions to bike storage and bike accessibility on and off trains and I think every market's got to look at uh, what's best for them but I think technology like this bike link card is is letting us uh, really expand the the uh, accessibility of using your bike uh, using your own bike uh, thank you um, I think another thing is uh, safety uh, there's a lot of theft of uh, bikes here in Santa Cruz for instance and you mentioned carbon fiber that could be a three thousand dollar bike I don't know that I'd bring my bike into a storage area that costs that much, but I think uh, addressing safety and uh, pilferage and damage to bikes that are stored is important. My second question is around technology. You talked a little bit about um, experimenting with different um, power sources and things like that. Very exciting. Uh, you also talked about um, trying to integrate different systems, which is also very exciting, to reduce cost. So um, are you in the bird seat in a sense? when you're talking about trying to come up with common standards so that technology isn't all sorts of things all over the area, you know, in terms of what's being developed, but trying to reduce costs by coming up with some common standards so that in terms of maintenance, in terms of interconnectivity, in terms of a whole variety of things that can be solved by common technology is being addressed at this early stage. Thanks. I wouldn't say I'm in the bird seat, but but we are able to fund R and D, and and I think that some things are becoming clear that that these are uh, uh, actual potential technologies, and these may not be, uh, and and so if we can zero in over the next three to four years on on this is going to work and this isn't, uh, then we can begin to start thinking about standards when it comes to propulsion. Uh, yeah, because as an individual vendor is trying to decide which direction to go. That could help tremendously because development costs are extremely expensive, and that's something they have to carry until they could sell their product. So you could help out a lot. That's why I asked about the bird seed thing. Yeah, and we're we're working with uh, a lot of the rail vendors today. Uh, we're we're not in a procurement right now, so we're able to have conversations with them. And 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 there's really only five or six major rail manufacturers in the world. Amtrak is going through a procurement. We're we're helping them. We're we're listening in on the, those briefings, um, but we're going out and saying, you know we don't just want to train, we want to train that, that, that's more efficient and that, that has a low platform or whatever it may be. And uh, California, it's, it's an odd place to be, but when California speaks, 
the vendors listen. Uh, and uh, it's cyclical in this country. Every 50 years, a big order comes in, a few companies compete, and then they go out of business for 30 years. Uh, now we're opening up, where where and the market is so small with those major vendors that they're going off around the world doing great R&D, selling great products, and then they come back here and they have something to offer us because our standards are adapting to theirs, global standards. Um, but with the dollar amounts and the growth that we could be seeing, we actually have the ability to help kind of shape the market and, and, and tell the builders um, standardize around this and, 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 and really be a, a powerful buyer. Thank you. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Yes, thank you. Um, what I what I haven't heard really um, in your conversation because I know this is primarily about passenger is is the F word, which is the freight. Um, freight's going to be using these lines as well, and I would imagine that we should see some funding as a result of freight and trying to um, bump those up. Do you have any figures of the changes that could happen with freight as a result of developing this rail system in as a whole? I don't have those numbers uh, on hand. They, they, we do discuss freight significantly. There's a whole chapter of it uh, in the rail plan. Uh, and, and what we do want to do is we want to look to any opportunity to shift goods movement uh, onto rail. Um, but at the same time, we're also trying to use more of that rail capacity for, for passenger. Um, we have very good relationships with the BNSF and the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, and we're talking about um, new approaches to using that capacity so that they can continue to grow while we also grow. We're also talking about where are the no-go lines for passenger trains? And, and, and if, we, you know, if we do not go there with passenger trains, do you have another opportunity for us uh, for passenger elsewhere? We're having those discussions. We're also working closely with a lot of the short line railroads. Uh, some of the, there's large holding companies which operate uh, many short lines in California. And we've been having uh, a lot of discussions with, with two of them in particular in the last year, looking at opportunities to, to uh, whether it's going out and finding a single shipper on a line or finding a, a market uh, along a line that may produce many shippers. Um, we're, we're working with them. They also own a lot of these branch lines. And so if we build a relationship with them, it's going to help us expand the passenger service uh, onto those branch lines as well, and, and, and we can invest together. Um, but we're certainly supporting uh, not just moving people, but moving more freight uh, by rail. And in and, and Southern California, with the ports of Long Beach, mm -hmm. and, uh, we are um, working very closely with UP and BNSF and well, I'm hoping as a result of that, we also see some funding that comes from that angle. Yes. Um, because obviously, if they're going to benefit from this, they should also financially contribute. Uh, and also, I know, I know that um, we, we have, uh, has there been any development in the areas that have to do with a collaboration between the, the rail and housing component? Because I know that there's a lot of uh, interest in developing housing along the pockets of the corridors. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is y s there's a divide here of either your housing, and this is the housing bond, this is transportation, this is a transportation bond. But if there's a collaborative effort, have you seen any of those kind of models work um, anywhere in California that says, let's, let's see what we can do to, to say, okay, I if we can do an incentive here that helps the housing demand in these pockets, that will also contribute to the, the transportation component. Have you had anything like that in conversation throughout or anywhere? Yeah, I'm, I'm still learning the alphabet soup of agencies in Sacramento, but there are a couple that, that I know are working very closely on this. The Strategic Growth Council, uh, the Department of Housing and Economic Development uh, are working with ARB, uh, 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 Office of Research and Planning. Um, they're all, they're all re they all realize, I would say, at the leadership level um, that, the, that we have to think about the, con the connection between transportation and land use and housing. Uh, and so um, there are programs for planning and technical assistance that are out there. Um, you know, uh, um, uh, the senator from San Francisco had the, 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 the housing bill last year, which, which didn't get through a committee. But there are thoughts about legislation, but there is a lot of activity going on uh, among the agencies that touch on housing and, and transportation, and there's collaboration and funding opportunities for planning. Uh, and I think that at least it, we're, they're in a very good place. They recognize it, uh, the need for it, and uh, I only hope that coordination continues. We'll, we'll, we'll continue to do our part. Yeah, because the thing is, if you, uh, it, it's a blend. I mean, our, our Measure D here was a blend. Um, we all pitched in on what our compromise was in order for us to get that two-thirds vote and, and being able to put that together. And it, um, this may be an opportunity in terms of getting that kind of blend that people know that we need this and others that we know that we need that, but how can we work collaboratively to, to make that happen? Um, and it might be something as, as one of the models used elsewhere, too, it, like the, the bucket list of where the local money came from and how creative local um, 
jurisdictions have been, maybe a list of like some ideas um, to give to the RTC to say, oh, this is how it worked in Marin, this is how it worked in San Diego, LA, whatever the sources, because I'll tell you that we're tapped out on the dollar in terms of the tax um, that we're charging our consumers in this, in this county or in our area here. So going back to them saying, you know, we're going to come after you for another tax. We want to know on a community basis here or county basis, how do we get creative of where this money is going to come from that needs to be extra on top of what we've already gone out to the taxpayers for? Um, we're going to have to figure that out. And I know that there's some answers that are out there and it would be helpful for us to see um, some of that that's happened elsewhere for them to come up with that last last matching uh, amount of money that's, that's um, needed for these projects. We, we, we talk about the efficiencies in the rail system in, in my uh, division, but but uh, I think that there's office, if we can tie it together with housing, if we think about transportation planning and land use planning together, then that's also a huge opportunity to deliver more with those tax dollars that you're getting already. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Granger, for that thorough presentation, especially the detailed answers to all our questions. What I'm going to have you do is step aside now and open up to the public, see if they have any questions. Uh, so if there's any questions from the public, uh, why don't you come up now? Go ahead, have two minutes for, for questions. You, you might want to point out that we're not necessarily going to answer those questions right no, now. We're going to take the same format and if we can instruct staff. We'll take the questions and then we can just post these on our website like we did the last presentation. So sure. go ahead, Mr. Nelson. Um, Jack Nelson, and this is just a very brief comment. Uh, one aspect of transportation that didn't get mentioned yet in this discussion is induced travel. So uh, you build a freeway lane. Uh, it's, it's, it attracts more traffic, it fills up, and so when it, once it's filled up, uh, your solution, your next solution uh, in, in that strategy is you have to build another lane because cars have the demand for space and you can't fix that. With a train, um, the train car fills up, it, uh, you know, you, you roll out train service, there's, de you know, it, the demand is there, the train car fills up. At that point, you don't have to build another rail line. You just add a train car. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, Peter Stanger. Um, what I got out of it was different from maybe what others did. Um, when the speaker said uh, uh, about the width of the trail and the train rails, uh, I don't know that he recognized that in many places here in Santa Cruz County, it gets too narrow. Um, he couldn't take a bus out to La Selva Beach because we have no bus service to La Selva Beach, but he would have walked out on the bluffs and he would have seen that it gets too narrow for both a bicycle lane and a train track. Uh, he could have looked up to the La Selva trestle and he would have seen that the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Committee had built a new bridge, but they didn't provide any room for the uh, <coughs> trail as well. Um, as far as the uh, uh, they deviated on uh, segment, uh, you all deviated with segment 17 of the rail trail, and uh, now when I came in on Beach Street, I could look across to uh, with all the uh, tanker uh, cars parked there with liquid propane gas, uh, which evidently is off limits also for the uh, trail to be built. And then when you think about the uh, Capitola trestle, um, your idea has, well, the original proposal was to just dump everybody off the train track trail and have them go through Capitola Village. So I really have to wonder about what, where we're going with the Regional Transportation Commission. Also, what you could do is the bullet train comes down um, from Caltrain, and it comes to the station in Dearden at 1 o'clock, at uh, 1.05, but, uh, but the Highway 17 bus leaves at 1 o'clock, so it gives us a 45-minute wait. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Botroff and fellow commissioners. My name is Mark Masidi Miller. I'm a professional engineer. I'm also chair of the Friends of the Rail and Trail. I know I've been here many times before. I wanted to add my thanks to Mr. Gettinger for an excellent presentation. Thank you very much for coming down and sharing your, your thoughts about the state rail plan with us. 
Um, I had a couple of questions. One was that it looked to me uh, like Santa Cruz County was an integral part of the state rail plan, but that time frame was 2040. And I'm wondering, how do we get Santa Cruz County to be part of that state rail plan by 2030? How, what do we have to do to accelerate our participation in this statewide integrated rail system? I like the idea of being able to get to LA in two hours. That, that, that's like 45 minutes to San Francisco. Um, so how do we accelerate? Uh, second, I, I uh, was pleased to see that there's money available for planning. Uh, it seems to me like that would be money well spent, would be to start planning how we're going to integrate our local branch line into the state rail network, and sooner would be better. Um, so since that money's available for those purposes, we ought to get after it. Uh, second, or third, uh, uh, Ms. Kaufman Gomez brought up the idea of creative financing, and I think that's in the forefront of everyone's mind. Um, housing is a clear need in our community. Transit is a clear need in our community. And maybe this is an opportunity for us to bind those together in a way that benefits all of us. So some creative thinking around that. Maybe there's some planning money that can be spent there. Uh, and I'm glad uh, Mr. Sanger brought up, brought up the uh, La Selva Trestle Bridge, because I was uh, wanted to remind you that that might be a possibility to cantilever a rail trail off of that bridge like we're doing in Santa Cruz right now, or like you're doing in Santa Cruz right now, at uh, substantial cost savings. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Saint again, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, to answer, to help answer your question, uh, Mr. McPherson, uh, I looked up a few of these rideshare things. It says one U.S. study indicates the global car uh, fleet could be reduced by a third if uh, sharing schemes were widely adopted. And to give you some specific numbers, it says car sharing schemes, whether point to point or free floating, also lead to reduced car ownership, with studies indicating five to 15 cars are replaced for each shared car added to a shared car fleet. So if you go between five and 15, 10 cars could be replaced just with one car share. So those are the basics. I wanted to ask one question this gentleman, excellent presentation. Um, what year, specifically, I, I know you showed it up here, but I, I missed it, would we be able to go to Pajaro Station and points east or up to the Bay Area on Caltrain or any type of train. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Brett Garrett. Um, I just want to ask uh, if Caltrans is considering elevated transit as a form of rail. Um, I strongly encourage doing so. In particular, looking at the SkyTrain system that expects to attain 200 miles an hour. Uh, I, I mean, I, there's a lot of doubts about the high-speed rail and whether the budget will accommodate that. And it just seems like the SkyTrain system could uh, achieve the goals at a much lower cost. And, and it would be worth taking a tiny sliver of the high-speed rail budget and putting it into building a prototype and seeing if it works. Um, I'm really impressed with the talk about having coordinated schedules so that you can, you know, just go across the station and get to the other uh, transit. Um, but I just want to point out that that would be so much simpler with a pod car system where there's no schedule, that they're just on whatever schedule the person is on. It just seems to me it would make those goals so much simpler to attain. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Yannicka Strauss with Bike Santa Cruz County. Um, connecting to the state rail system and the state in general via transit, it would be a transformative uh, opportunity for our community, both in sustainability, our economy, and accessibility. We currently, you know, to go down south, you need uh, to take the Greyhound, and that is, um, you know, not convenient or accessible for people. Um, the jump bike success in Santa Cruz right now shows how successful a first last mile, or that there is a first last mile solution right here in our community already. Um, I really appreciate Mr. Grattinger's spending time today on the cohesion of bikes and trains. Um, the average trip distance for a cyclist is three miles. 
To live a car-free or car-light life, we need to have a long-distance option. He said, if you're willing to make it work, there's always a way. We need to lean into the future and catch up with the world's transportation innovation and continue it to explore passenger rail in Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, I very much, again, like the spirit of this speaker series. I like the idea that we're exploring options. I like the idea that we're bringing here to try to help us find the best solution for our county. I wish that Mr. Triplett, when he was here, would have been allotted equal time to Mr. Monseron, if I'm saying his name correctly. Um, it just would have been more fair and equitable. Um, I wish there were more diversity in this series and that it better reflected the full range of things that we are currently looking at in the UCIS and also the full range of options that the state of California is looking at as solutions for our whole state, many, of, many areas of which are facing similar gridlock problems to us. What if we were to fully explore these options? Mr. Gradinger mentioned today it wasn't the focus of his talk, but he did mention the Congested Corridors Program, which is funding HOT and other highway solutions, which are not included in our UCIS and which are not currently being looked at here, but which might actually be the most equitable, climate-friendly solutions for our county. I hope we have the courage to fully explore all options, Mr. Johnson mentioned yesterday um, an Orange County op-ed. There was also one in our own Sentinel yesterday looking at problems with the DMV and a second time calling for an end to the bullet train. What if we not only wait for our own unified corridor study results, we try to make sure we're not tied into a freight rail plan that closes off our options, and we maybe even wait for the the November election to see who our new governor is and what he's going to do about the state rail plan. Because we as a county surely don't want to tie ourselves to something that dies with a new governor. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I sure thank Kyle for the, the presentation and, and it's very exciting um, to me. And, and I think hopefully all of you all have had the pleasure of being in Europe and other places where rail is a, is a, a, a staple. Um, uh, as I observe the different uh, camps, you know, everybody has a preferred mode, uh, PRT and Greenway and wait, wait, wait. We, we hear the same thing over and over again. Wait till this study is done. Do another study. If I don't get my way, we better do another study. Wait till there's a different president. And I mean... When I stood here in June of 2015, I think it was, when the, when the uh, feasibility study came back, and it said, this is a good idea, this could work. Unfortunately, they, they, they scored the highest uh, two, two uh, scenarios that didn't go all the way to, to Watsonville, and I thought, well, then go to Watsonville, for goodness sake. I feel like we've been waiting a long time, and we've been doing a lot of studies, and here we stand today. The difference between three years ago and today is Pajaro Station is a part of a plan that's funded and being built by Monterey. There's a state rail plan. There's uh, 136.8 billion in that plan. Our population weighted share of that fund, if it stays intact, is $950 million. Now I know that's, that's not money that's there yet, but if it, if it came out, that's enough for three systems, four, five maybe. Uh, this is, you know, I'm waiting for the Unified Corridors Investment Study to come back. I'm confident that it's going to score uh, passenger rail service well. And I sure hope I live to see uh, the point where, where we can, as a community, and I know it has to be a community decision, can uh, commit to moving forward with, uh, with passenger rail and a trail. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close this presentation. Uh, again, Mr. Granger, thank you very much for coming. We're going to get the questions that we've assembled here to you, and you can get them back to our office, and we'll post them on our website. So with that, we'll move on to the uh, next presentation, which is a Highway 1 Bus on Shoulder Feasibility Study. This will be uh, Sarah Christensen from our uh, office.
Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. So today we're going to um, receive a presentation from the consultant uh, about the Monterey Bay Area Feasibility Study for bus operations on the shoulder of Highway 1. We're also going <coughs> to receive an update on uh, the Highway 1 41st SoCal um, Auxiliary Lanes Project and how the potential um, bus on shoulder improvements may be able to be integrated into that project. And then lastly, um, we'll be asking for authorization uh, to enter into negotiations for a co-op with uh, Metro to fund this initial effort. Um, and so with that, I'm just going to hand it right over to Bill. Bill Hurl, he is with uh, CDM Smith, and he um, was in charge of this feasibility study. And I'm going to hand it over to Bill. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, so uh, this is a very interesting and exciting project, and I'm happy to be able to brief you on it this morning. Uh, first, start out with a little bit of the, the history of the, well, what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk, talk about the history, the findings of the feasibility study itself, and then what some of the next steps will be. Uh, some of you may be aware, but in 2013, AB 946 was passed, and that allows both Monterey and Santa Cruz counties to implement bus on shoulder operations as a pilot project uh, subject to approval by Caltrans and the California Highway Patrol. And pursuant to that, uh, Monterey Salinas Transit actually obtained funding from AMBAG and also from TAMSI and Metro to conduct this particular study. And the study covers the, both counties, Monterey and Santa Cruz, though today, of course, I'm going to focus on what's happening here in Santa Cruz County. Uh, in Monterey County, it also covers the use of the Monterey uh, Branch Rail Corridor, very uh, germane to the earlier topic this morning. In terms of the project itself, we started uh, in December 2016, and we uh, most of the data that we collected is from 2016, and then we had many meetings with stakeholders, uh, the RTC staff and Metro are key participants here in Santa Cruz County. <clears throat> and then we issued our feasibility study just about uh, a little over six weeks ago. So bus on shoulder. I think when people hear the idea of bus on shoulder, they, they envision a freeway, sort of like Highway 1 was this morning going northbound, where traffic is just at a crawl and that buses are zooming by on the shoulder at, let's say, 55, 60 miles an hour. Well, that's not what bus on shoulder is. Bus on shoulder is a very controlled operating scenario where buses uh, only use the shoulder when traffic speeds are below 35 miles per hour. And then the bus operators are specially trained in how to use the shoulder. And one of the key things is that they never are allowed to go more than 15 miles an hour faster than the traffic. So there, it's essentially a way of bypassing congested traffic on the shoulder, but operating in a very safe um, format. In order for bus on shoulder to work, there's certain things that have to exist, and one of them is the shoulder has to be uh, wide enough and strong enough to support the buses. At least 10 feet wide is, is the uh, standard that sort of evolved on a national basis. Uh, 12 feet would be better if, it, if you could have it. And also we have to make sure the shoulder area is clear for the buses. There aren't signs that overhang it or other obstacles uh, that would impede or interfere with the buses. And by the way, there's over um, 500 miles of bus on shoulder operations throughout the United States. So it's not a, it's not a new idea. It's, it's been in existence since the late, uh, since the 1990s. Our study area here in Santa Cruz focuses primarily on the area between uh, Morrissey Boulevard and Freedom Boulevard on Highway 1. Uh, as you're well aware, one of the key things that's going to be happening on Highway 1 is the development of the auxiliary lanes. And there are, the map shows, but there are some auxiliary lane sections in place now, but by the year 2025, we 
expect that there'll be auxiliary lanes all the way from Morrissey Boulevard to State Park Drive, and then beyond that uh, to the south and further in the future. But that's, that you'll see that's an important aspect of what we looked at with this particular study. So one of the things that you have to have for bus on shoulder to work is congestion, because that, that's the whole idea, you bypass congestion. So, so I think you have that. <laughs> I don't think that's an issue. Uh, what we did here is we, uh, we used cellular data, actually, from a company called Inrex. And for an entire year, this is for the year of 2016, and the dark shaded area, or the red area, shows where speeds drop below um, 35 miles an hour, which, as I mentioned before, is sort of the threshold for bus on shoulder. And down the left, Dan column, that's time of day. Uh, and across the top are locations. It's a little hard to read, but basically what it tells us is that from between those areas I talked about, Freedom Boulevard to Morrissey, uh, throughout, in this case, 3 o'clock in the afternoon till um, uh, 7 o'clock at night, there is congestion. On a typical, this is for a, what's called 50 percentile or the typical average day. Uh, so congestion definitely exists, and this same pattern exists in, in both the, this is a southbound, but it exists northbound um, in the morning, southbound in the afternoon, very directional. So uh, to address the situation, we developed a number of alternatives, and the first one is the, is the idea of what I would call classic bus on shoulder. Uh, the, the goal was just see what we can do with the existing shoulders and where can we uh, actually find enough width and the, the right operating conditions to have bus on shoulder. Uh, we called it interim because the idea was it might happen before the auxiliary lanes were put in place because as you can imagine, once the auxiliary lanes are under construction, that that's going to change everything in terms of the shoulders and so forth. Uh, wh what we found was that there's some ability to do bus on shoulder in the southbound direction, uh, almost no ability in the northbound direction. This is on the right-hand shoulder, by the way. We also looked at the left-hand shoulder, but that is even worse. There's really no opportunity to do it on the left-hand shoulder. Uh, just because the shoulders are not wide enough, uh, this is a very old highway. It hasn't changed much over the years. It's, uh, the shoulders are not up to current standards, either in terms of their width or their strength. So in order to do any extensive bus on shoulder, uh, it involves quite an investment. But there are, are some sections we identified where you could possibly do it. There's the red sections on the. Yes, 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 sorry, I should have <coughs> pointed that out. And then um, there are two different options that we looked at, which, which sort of piggyback on the auxiliary lane project. They, they could not occur before the auxiliary lanes. They could occur at the same time or after the auxiliary lanes are put in place. And the first one we call the hybrid because it, uh, the way it would operate is, if you understand auxiliary lanes, they're basically a connection between the, the on-ramp and the off-ramp. So it's a lane in between the two but it does not extend through the interchanges. So between the interchanges where the auxiliary lanes exist, the buses would be in the auxiliary lane along with the other traffic. Auxiliary lanes tend to operate faster than the general freeway lanes, so the buses would get some time advantage from that. And then as the auxiliary lane ends and goes into the off-ramp, the bus would just continue straight on ahead and go into the shoulder through the interchange area. Part of the auxiliary lane project is make sure those shoulders meet the uh, current state standards so they would be upgraded to the 10-foot minimum. And so we're essentially taking advantage of that investment that you're planning to make with this particular option. Um, the second option is pure bus on shoulder. So it takes advantage of the fact that with the auxiliary lanes, the shoulders will be improved also all the way but in this case, the bus stays on, it gets on the shoulder and essentially stays there. It does pose an, an operating uh, challenge in that as you approach the, uh, you're in the shoulder and then uh, 
as you approach where there's an off-ramp, the bus has to merge back out because the, the shoulder, um, there's the shoulder, then there's the auxiliary lane. So you have to get into the auxiliary lane and then onto the shoulder in order for it to continue. So there's a jogging movement there. But even so, buses, um, this concept has worked elsewhere and it, it is workable, but it does have that one operating issue. So the option A is definitely much more um, operationally feasible than option B, although they're both uh, quite feasible from a bus on shoulder operation standpoint. And then the third alternative uh, was to look at the project that's already been studied previously and is part of the regional transportation plan in terms of long range, and that's HOV lanes. The one difference with what we looked at is that the Santa Cruz Metro asked us, what's, the, what's sort of the best segment for HOV lanes where you get the most benefit? So we looked at all the traffic information and we looked at the engineering information regarding costs. So the, the best segment would be from Soquel Avenue all the way to uh, State Park uh, to get the most bang for the buck with that uh, particular one. So this would be typical, you know, be adding a la lane in each direction in the median. Uh, buses could use the lane, but also uh, carpools and other uh, exempt, like clean air vehicles and so forth could use the lane. That's kind of the, the uh, just typical HOV lane investment. And you can imagine this is a much bigger investment than the other options that we're talking about. In fact, this table kind of summarizes that for each of the alternatives. So what we found, starting with the interim bus on shoulder, is that quite a bit of money would need to be spent, about $14 million, to upgrade the current shoulders in the southbound direction for certain segments to make this particular option work. And uh, there was a, there's a small gain in transit ridership from that because it's only, it's only a certain portion of the freeway. So the cost-benefit ratio was very low. It was only 0.2. And we're, we're looking for a cost-benefit ratio. The benefit should be bigger than cost, so it should be higher than one. Uh, now, the, the two options uh, using the auxiliary lanes both did quite well. Uh, their cost is relatively low in the range of $8 million. Ridership benefits are pretty strong, and the cost-benefit ratio for both of them are strong. We, uh, I think because of the operational issue that I talked about, our, uh, the first option tends to, to, in our minds, to be more practical and more feasible uh, than the second. But, but again, as I said, they're both quite feasible. Uh, the third option, the HOV lane project, and we only looked at benefits to transit riders for this project, so the cost benefits very low because of the high cost, 364 million, is what we estimated. So it's quite high. So our key findings here. Um, first, no surprise to anybody, there's very severe congestion. Secondly, uh, Metro, um, and we, I didn't talk about this, but they experience a lot of issues uh, when they do operate on Highway 1, and, and frankly, they've somewhat avoided any major service on Highway 1 because it is so um, congested and unreliable. And then the current shoulders just really aren't suitable for uh, any practical bus on shoulder operation, although there could be something done in the southbound direction. Um, but it probably doesn't make a lot of sense given that the auxiliary lane projects are, are coming. Um, relatively soon. The option, um, so if you did want to do bus on shoulder, by the way, the best segment is actually south of the railroad bridges. Uh, uh, there's the shoulders, as you go further south, the shoulders get better and wider. Of course, the problem there is that the, um, the congestion is not as severe in that area. So, so the prime area of congestion has kind of been bypassed when you get to that point. So the best opportunity um, is either option 2A and 2B, but option 2A, uh, which is the hybrid solution using the auxiliary lanes with the uh, bus on shoulder through the interchanges, definitely is operationally superior to option 2B. And this is, again, uh, looking at that particular 
option. It's uh, relatively straightforward. Really all that needs to be done for the most part is signing and striping. And there are a few areas where more detailed engineering may identify uh, some small obstacles and things that need to be removed, but nothing, nothing significant that we know of. As yeah. far as uh, next steps, of course, today, today we're talking with you. There are presentations coming up, I guess, a week from Friday at Santa Cruz Metro and then next Wednesday at TAMSI for this. And in both counties, there's interest in further evaluating um, the uh, bus on shoulder here with the auxiliary lanes in Monterey. Uh, they have the same problem with their shoulders not being adequate, but there is still interest in it. But there's also strong interest in use of the uh, rail uh, right of way for buses there in Monterey County. So, um, so with that, I guess I'll turn it back to Sarah. So um, basically the, the goal at this point is to um, see if we can uh, expedite the bus on shoulder elements, um, has to go through the Caltrans process of a project initiation, it has to have a project approval and environmental document. Um, and the intent is to expedite this um, process uh, with the goal of catching up the bus on shoulder elements prior to the auxiliary lanes project going to construction in 2020. Ideally, we would like to construct as one package to limit um, construction impacts to the general public. We see a lot of benefit and efficiencies with that. So. Um, Metro, uh, we've been working closely with them, um, and we've basically the next step is to develop an operating concept for the facility. Um, and Metro has, um, pending their board approval, uh, have agreed to invest uh, $50,000 for this effort um, to develop this concept. This is going to be an iter iterative process with Caltrans, Metro, the RTC. Um, also CHP um, to develop uh, what's called a concept of operations. Um, we're looking at a few st streamlined project delivery approaches for the bus on shoulder elements uh, to get them caught up and hopefully if we can uh, achieve that we can get it into one construction package. So an update on the Highway 1 41st SoCal Auxiliary Lanes project. Back in May, um, you authorized us to negotiate a cooperative agreement with Caltrans for the PSNE phase, which we've been doing. Uh, we've been going back and forth, and we're very close to having a uh, cooperative agreement. Hopefully in September, I'll be back to um, ask for your approval for that. Um, we've also been very busy with uh, procuring a professional engineering consultant. Uh, to prepare the construction documents for the auxiliary lanes for the PSNE phase. What we did with the procurement was um, as the feasibility study was finishing up, we decided to add uh, this evaluation of the operating concept to the scope of work for the engineering consultant. Uh, so this kind of allows us to um, really get going quickly um, if we all agree that that's what we want to do. Um, so hopefully we'll have a consultant on board in September as well. Um, and so today we're here to ask um, authorization for the executive director to enter into negotiations for a cooperative agreement with, the, with Metro to fund the preparation of the operating concept for the bus on shoulder. Um, and the reason we need that is because it will be the RTC's um, consultant who's doing the uh, PSNE for the highway project who will be doing uh, the bus on shoulder uh, development of the concept. And Metro has um, contributed $50,000 to that effort. So with that, um, I'm sure there's questions. So um, we're here to help answer. Okay, thank you for that presentation. So what we'll do is we'll uh, have a commissioner questions and we'll open up to the public 
and then we'll bring it back for a recommendation and consideration. So uh, we'll start down this end. Uh, Mr. Mulhern, any questions? Mr. Rodkin. Well, first of all, <clears throat> let me express my huge excitement about this. If you think about buses, even if they only go 20% faster, um, which is something in the range we're talking about here, people drive stuck in this traffic, look and watch a bus, and it's not going by them at 60, as the presenter made clear, but um, going by faster, and, and the auxiliary lanes already work, definitely move faster from uh, before Soquel if you're going south. Um, but so I'm very excited about this possibility. The Metro also would save m money because it takes us, we waste money and time with the buses stuck in traffic. So the extent to which it's faster would free money for additional buses to actually be on this system. And so the over impacted buses like this Route 71 and 69s um, could benefit from this as well. Um, so I think this is huge. Um, my first question is there, there, there are some costs that, that weren't mentioned, but I assume would be part of the the cost of this, and maybe this is too detailed too early, but my, my question, for example, when you go under the, when it goes, let's take uh, plan A, where it goes the, uh, where it goes under the, the uh, bridge at SoCal Avenue, you have cars coming, there's a traffic signal system, and the cars enter the highway going south after the bridge, but the buses are gonna be coming underneath there, you're gonna have to have some traffic signal cost, I assume, to have the bus know that it's okay. Unless it's not enough very much merge room there at Soquel Avenue and some of the other bridges. So I'm sort of assuming that you have to have a traffic signal coordination system. That's like $100,000 or something. Another cost would be the fact that on some of these bridges, you have a slope coming down from the side that you might have to um, cut back on and build a retaining wall so that you actually have the 10 to 12 feet that you need to make this thing work, I think. Um, so I'm, uh, when you talk about the 14, I got the price right here, the $14 million for this with the auxiliary lanes, uh, addition to the auxiliary lane cost, does that include things like the signal prioritization thing or, the, or you know, any kind of construction under the bridge to make a, there's enough room? And I assume you've studied that the buses all can go under the bridges that far over on the right side, um, right you know, where it would be on the shoulder at this point. There's a lot of questions wrapped yeah. together. <laughs> so let me start at the beginning. Well, the, the first thing is that the cost that we estimated was around $8 million. $8 million. And, and uh, so it, it includes uh, whatever physical things we saw needed to be changed. But it's important to keep in mind the auxiliary lane projects do address some of these deficiencies of the shoulders through the interchanges. So the, like the retaining wall situation that you talked about, if that if the shoulder isn't wide enough now, then that type of thing would be done. It wouldn't correctly. be where the auxiliary lane is though, because it's be under the bridge. The auxiliary lane is oh. going to go turn off the exit at Soquel, and you're going to be going on shoulder where there's currently no improvement. There's there's some space there. I, I looked at it today as I drove down. Yeah. No, but it it it, it is actually part of it. And then the um, where in general when the when you're on the shoulder and you approach an on ramp. The operator again; they're specially trained, so they, in a situation like you're describing, they they would decide either on decide just to get probably just get out of the shoulder and go into the into the regular lane at that location when there's cars entering. Because yeah, wherever the there's an issue. So that's the whole concept of bus on shoulder is is um, make use of the flexibility of the operation and don't spend a lot of money on capital improvements. Uh, that's what makes it so effective. And then the, the traffic signaling thing, that's something that will be looked at as part of this next phase that Sarah was talking about. Uh, there's been some discussion with Caltrans about it. Um, one thing, um, we, we want to be more of a signaling type thing than rather than a, what's called a ramp metering approach. I understand. So. The, the bus driver would know when the cars are coming in, yeah. when they have a green light versus when they don't or something, it seems like. Just, uh, well, the, there would be a transmitter on the bus and there'd be a detector at the traffic signal. So as the bus approached, it, the traffic signal would detect that. And it then, could preempt the signal. And then stop the, stop the traffic on oh, the ramp. Great. Um, that uh, those costs are not included in the $8 million. So we, that's just, that would be separate. So. And then my second and last question is um, the um, if when after the auxiliary lanes are 
constructed in both directions, which is the plan, would there then be the ability to have this bus on shoulder going north or not? I didn't well, understand. It, uh, yeah. it wouldn't work without the auxiliary lanes, but the, with the two the two A project with the auxiliary lanes that goes in both directions. It's right? in both directions, right? Because I yeah. wasn't sure I understood that. I, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. It wouldn't it wouldn't work just with bus on shoulder currently without the auxiliary lanes because there's not room on the shoulder. You're telling us, but it, with the auxiliary lanes, it would be working both directions, morning and evening. That's right. Yes. I have to just say I'm more than prepared to make this motion to get into this, but I'll wait till the time comes <laughs> right. Thank you. That. Sorry, just to clarify, the auxiliary lanes uh, project uh, widening is just between the on-ramp and the next off-ramp. So where we're talking about putting the buses on shoulder at the interchanges, that pavement widening, it's not very much, but that pavement widening would be part of the bus on shoulder improvement. So it would have to have its own project approval environmental document. We haven't costed everything out because we haven't, we don't have really a concept yet, but later this year we should have a cost. And so we're anticipating because it's only at the interchanges, the, um, the capital cost is really gonna be not very much. Right. Um, and so we're looking at potentially having a streamlined project delivery approach because of that. And then also at interchanges, it's already disturbed, and so um, it's most likely not going to require uh, extensive, you know, biological or any kind of right. um, studies like that because it's already it's already disturbed area. So we're hoping to to move it forward um, quickly. Thank you. I'm going to go out of order for a minute. I've got a commissioner that has to leave in five minutes. Commissioner Chase. Yeah, I want to thank you for the presentation. Um, Chair and I uh, had an opportunity to receive a presentation in the Metro Capital Committee meeting. I guess that was that this week or last week? This week. It all gets combined. Um, and so we were supportive of the presentation and uh, recommendation to move it forward to the Metro uh, Transit District to discuss. So I just, I, I have to excuse myself. So I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation. It's exciting. Um, we did get to hear this earlier this weekend and appreciate that this is coming forward because it's really exciting and I think a game changer. Thanks. And Commissioner McPherson, yeah, did you want to go leave about noon myself, but uh, I, um, as chair of uh, Metro, I, th I think this is very exciting. First of all, it, it addresses two issues that were on me in Measure D uh, to uh, address uh, improvements on Highway 1, auxiliary lanes, and to uh, see how we can improve the services of Metro. This is a twofer, and I think it's a, a tremendous project, and I'm as enthusiastic about it as Mr. Rotkin, I think. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, I will um, echo um, my colleagues on this. I think it's, you know, this is a ribbon of uh, transportation corridor that is meant to do exactly what you're describing, move people. Uh, and I think being as, uh, as aggressive as po possible in terms of facilitating and expediting, and even if it costs an extra, you know, million dollars here or five million dollars there, um, to provide metro service so they don't have to take the side streets of Soquel Avenue and, uh, you know, pollute those um, uh, uh, ribbons of uh, stoplights and so forth and actually do something on the, on the freeway is very important. And I would also, you know, I was just talking to my colleague here. She, she was um, nice enough to... Uh, uh, tamp down some of my uh, expectations, but you know, it seems that towards the center of the freeway, where um, you you, uh, you know you have uh, the middle, is it possible to maybe extend the ribbon of asphalt by two or three feet, uh, and then maybe move the highway closer to the center of the of the um, corridor? And then just you know cobble out small amounts of, of operating room uh, that allows you to kind of have more operating room where these bus rapid transit possibilities exist. Um, again, I don't know if that's something that we should explore during the EIR process, but um, I'm, people are shaking their heads already. And so, <laughs> um, but do you know. see what I'm saying? In other words, you expand it towards the middle makes more room on the, on the right-hand side. And my second question, this is for a metro, um, are, there, 
uh, specialized buses that would uh, lend themselves to a more um, efficient way of, of moving, kind of maybe more narrow uh, and longer, that allows bus drivers to kind of uh, navigate this uh, bus rapid transit scenario? That's my question. Well, um, the, your first question about um, shifting the traveled lanes uh, to the inside, so um, that is possible if um, we could get design exceptions from Caltrans. Um, I would not uh, advise us going that route, though, because design exceptions, basically Caltrans has a highway design manual, and the standard uh, shoulder width is 10 feet on the inside as well as the outside. And um, just from my experience of ge getting design exceptions, it's not easy to get design exceptions, and um, especially if you have enough right-of-way, which we do. Even though it's not paved currently, we do have some right-of-way to do a little bit of widening. So um, I would not, that's why we are not pursuing that at this time. Um, and then the other question. <laughs> Off, offhand, I don't know of any any buses any that are purposely narrower uh, buses, but, but I should say it, the width of the bus isn't really a big issue. It's uh, the ten if we can get ten feet, um, that's more than adequate. The typical bus is roughly about ten and a half feet from outside mirror to outside mirror. Uh, but as you might imagine, when they're in they're in the shoulder lane, there's room. For them to extend out on either side, they don't. Uh, it's not really a problem. They um, and I and I should say this has been, as I mentioned before, it's been occurring all over the country. It did occur in San Diego as a demonstration project and was quite successful. And actually, they used the same format we're talking about. They had auxiliary lanes coupled with uh, going on the shoulder, and that worked quite well. And they're actually uh, so they actually ended up making improvements to that section of freeway to add an HOV lane later. So they stopped that project, but they're now uh, getting ready to implement another bus on shoulder project in San Diego. And there's one um, under study now for Highway 680 in Contra Costa County. Marin County is looking at bus on shoulder. Santa Clara County is looking at bus on shoulder. So it's an idea that's really catching on. And uh, the beauty of it is that it doesn't require a lot of special things. That keeps the cost low and it makes it easy to implement, so. Thank you. Commissioner Bertrand. I have a feeling there was a lot of staff work to make this work. All the agencies mentioned, difficult to maneuver and bring such a report to us, so thank you very much. Uh, I was mentioned that there's gonna be the need for special training and I was wondering if that could be commented on. And also, it seems to me that uh, regular commuters are gonna to have to get used to this new vehicle passageway on the right side. So if you could comment on that too, and what we could do as an agency to make sure the public is uh, well aware of this as something that's coming. Well, as I've been saying, there's a lot of good, good experience and history to build upon with this. So uh, Minnesota has been the leader in, in bus on shoulder, and they were the first ones to develop the training programs for operators. You want the operator to know how how to handle every situation that would come up on the shoulder. You know what to do if they spot, you know, a vehicle stopped on the shoulder. What if the, the CHP is uh, using the shoulder? What if there's a, a major accident occurring where emergency vehicles need to use the shoulder to get to the accident site. All those things need to be taken under consideration. So the operators receive training. They also receive training how to maneuver through the on ramps and off ramps, which are the most critical areas. Uh, and, and typically they're given the option of, of using the shoulder or not. So they, if the operator feels it's not, not safe on a given day, they can opt out of doing using the shoulder. They don't have to use it. Um, although in San Diego, when the operators didn't use the shoulder, the riders would start uh, yelling, <laughs> saying, get on the shoulder. So it's very popular. Um, so, that's, so, so that relates to the training. 
aspect of it. And I forgot, what was the second half of your question? My other concern was the public in general. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is going to be a new development. Yeah. So um, there is, uh, again, and there will be a need for public education with this, but there also is, there's also a lot of experience with the types of signs to be used and so forth uh, to make sure that this, um, that people, when they're on the freeway, that they're, that buses can operate on the shoulder. In fact, it'll be more specific than that. It'll, it will say, it'll say that it's only to buses that are essentially um, proved to use the shoulder. So it's not just any bus can use the shoulder. That's that's an important important thing. So. I don't know. You um, so this just is not really. Oh, sorry. Just really quick. I was the project manager of the San Diego project. All good questions. All dealt with training, signage, no incidents in five years. Thank you oh, for that. One other question just occurred to me. So how about the public if they decide <laughs> they're going to do it just like what uh, the mayor of uh, Watsonville uh, relayed uh, earlier? So is that fraction or is that permissible? Uh, well, it's a it is a concern that I've heard, um, but again, the actual experience has been that, that that's not a problem. It it is quite clear. I mean, people in California, and it's actually better here than in most states. They're they're trained that the shoulder is not a place that you operate your vehicle, and uh, uh, but but all across the country, again, there has not been any big issue with people using the shoulder. Uh, you know, inappropriately because of this uh, happening. There is an issue, as I mentioned, if there's a major incident or something, then uh, then suddenly the shoulder becomes, you know, it may be you actually use, the CHP may actually direct people onto the shoulder, but typically, no, it's not a problem, so. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Thank you. I, I'm not sure if you would be the specific person to um, answer the question. It might be a, a bit more of the metro. Uh, we're looking at peak time um, in terms of the bus usage for the, the, the shoulder. And how would we be looking at maybe the buses diverting to be able to use as an opportunity and coming off of, like, for example, Soquel, where they're picking up passengers? So what kind of volume and frequency would we we'd actually be looking at for these shoulders? Um, obviously, since this is so far in the future, I don't haven't laid out service plans, but we start with the service we have. And currently, we don't operate a lot of services that work in the neighborhoods, be it SoCal or, or whatever, and then jump back on the freeway. We essentially operate an express between Watsonville and Santa Cruz on there. That would be the initial service, and we would obviously incre increase the frequency. At that time, we'd consider whether there are more opportunities. But like I said, in our system now, we don't do a lot of on and off mixing the freeway with central Santa Cruz functions. So currently, are we a bus every half hour for the uh, four-hour window of time that this is looking at happening? I mean, is four hours the window? I, I don't know. Well, given the fact that you can get on it or off of it, our express services do run all day. They do run about a half hour in the peak. Um, and if, they're, if the uh, general traffic lanes are going fast enough, you stay in them. If not, you move over. Would we increase frequency? I don't think we'd go to all the work to build this project and that not bump the frequency during the peak periods, but that becomes a matter of operating dollars and when we get there. Okay, and my other question has to do with the EIR. Um, our current EIR um, from start to still working on to get to our Highway 1 projects now, um, let everybody know what the duration of time is because I don't know when it started and I know we're not quite there yet and then we're talking about another EIR for this one so what can we expect in terms of having the results of an EIR and or can we put this as a chapter in the current one so that we might be able to push this along a little bit um, more quickly so we're so close to having it done that so we close, don't yes. want to um, add more we want to keep we want to keep the two projects clearly separate um, the t the you're referring to the tier one tier two combined environmental document we're expecting to have it approved at the end of the year um, and we went through an extensive you know public outreach and circulation and all of that um, the bus on shoulder project is considered a tier two project under the overall program it has to go through its own environmental studies and project approval process now you mentioned an EIR um, it 
most likely will not be anything close to an EIR. Um, because of the small amount of pavement needed and signs, striping, this sort of thing, it's really um, most likely going to be uh, exempt under CEQA. So um, assuming that, this really, you know, that's why we're looking at an expedited approach. If it required an EIR, we would not be considering an expedited approach. So just to clarify that. Did that answer your question? I believe so, yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Well, uh, as a Metro representative, I'm excited. But I share with my other colleagues. This is a great project. I just have one question. What's the uh, funding source for this project, the $8 million? So you're talking about the capital cost of the construction. Correct. So um, we don't have a funding plan yet, um, and we don't know exactly how much it's going to cost, really. The, the $8 million is an estimate at sure. this point for planning purposes. Um, so once we develop the operating concept, we'll have more real numbers, and then we can develop um, a plan. But there's a lot of sources of funds out there um, for this. Um, you know, the first uh, little bit of, of doing the operating concept is going to be funded by Metro, which is great. Um, so hopefully we can keep that going for the support costs, and then for construction, um, you know, we'll be looking for funding just like for the auxiliary lanes. We'll be looking for um, SB1 money, hopefully, um, or other competitive grants. <clears throat> okay, great. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, at this point, we're going to go ahead and uh, have you step aside, open up for the public. Uh, anybody from the public like to comment on the uh, bus on shoulder? Yes, thank you. Um, my brother lives in Minneapolis. That's where I grew up, and he is a bus on shoulder rider. So um, he lives in South Minneapolis, works downtown. Uh, I-35W uh, South is perhaps crawling at 10 miles an hour, and he's on a bus on shoulder bus that's whizzing by at 25 miles per hour. That's 150% faster for getting home. And so if you're in a car and you look at that and say, hey, I, I'm going to get one of those. So this has been in place in, in, in the Twin Cities since the 1990s. It's, it's a solution that's been hiding in plain sight. It belonged in the RTC's EIR study as an alternative. There have been no alternatives in the study other than uh, widening lanes, adding lanes for cars. Um, so uh, maybe that EIR still needs uh, an actual alternative like this studied in there. And in the presentation, I didn't see mention the cost of those ox lanes and the cost of HOV lanes. HOV lanes upside of 600 million. So what if you took some of that kind of car-oriented money and put it directly into a primo bus on shoulder system and had money left over to uh, send some operational costs and so forth over to the metro, more buses, and you, you, you've, you've really started to do something right for uh, commuters and right for the environment. Uh, that, that would be uh, super duper. And you know, also looking ahead to the future, if I may add one more point, um, right now we have climate denialism in, in effect in Washington, D.C., but we're going to change. Uh, Congress now has a Congressional solu uh, Climate Solutions Caucus that's growing. It's bipartisan. And when we're ready, we're going to pass carbon fee and dividend legislation that puts a gradually increasing price on carbon. And that's going to drive people out of their cars and towards um, uh, fr climate fr friendlier solutions like the bus. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Saint, uh, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, tried reading this last night. It was incredibly long, but I didn't get, I just tried to get to certain aspects of it. I'm not an expert on it by any means. Um, so what I'm trying to understand here is we're going to say that we're going to get ox lanes two and three constructed by 2025 or 26. Um, so basically seven more years of traffic congestion plus construction um, and any litigation that may come up may extend this to a longer period. Um, and we're still going to have the Aptos, what they're calling the Strangler, slowing things down and only four miles done and $100 million gone. Um, why not, just a suggestion after being kind of brain dead last night, um, why not widen shoulders to 10 feet 
without the ox lanes. <coughs> in other words, leave the present infrastructure, do the 10 feet for the bus on shoulder um, to State Park. That was kind of the plan for the ox lanes anyway. And do alternative one at that point. It's 0.8 miles from State Park to Rio Del Mar Boulevard. Bring the bus back on. It goes the eight tenths of the mile. You're at Rio Del Mar, and this gentleman had said, "Pretty good shoulders after you get up to that area." So then you can go back onto the bus on shoulder. Um, for now, maybe we could study that cost also, inclusive with the rest of it. Um, and then you're getting close to getting the whole 7.5 miles done with the exception of the difficult area of the two trestles, which is said in the study 124 million to do that aspect. Um, use the 100 million from Oxaline project to get the majority of the funding. And I think if you uh, approach the state as well as federal as this as a mass transit project, um, you'll get more support for your funding and some matching funds for that to maybe complete the rest of the 7.5 miles. I had other comments, but time's thank, up. Thank, thank you. you. Hi, I'm Brett Garrett. Um, it would be great if this table could come back on the screen. It was up there a few minutes ago. Um, it's 1.2 in the... Um, my comments will mention that. Um, anyway, I just want to say I, I, I like the concept of bus on shoulder. Um, I think we're missing some important data, which is uh, the unified corridor study is going to also be studying bus rapid transit on the corridor, on the train corridor, and on Soquel. Um, it's not obvious to me if bus on freeway shoulder will be faster than those options that will be studied in the UCS. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. I just don't know. Um, I did find the feasibility study to be somewhat confusing and maybe some misleading information. Um, in this table that I just mentioned on the environmental issues, it, it shows that uh, bus on shoulder um, the interim plan has eight environmental impacts compared to none for the bus on the with the on shoulder with the auxiliary lanes. Somehow the environmental impact of the aux lanes is swept under the rug. Um, they're, I don't think they're a done deal yet because they still have to go through an EIR process that isn't isn't finished. Um, and I don't believe they attain their goals of reducing congestion or um, safety. So I don't I don't really. Yeah, so, <laughs> and also this number in the lower left of that table, it, it basically says that the no-build project will save 8.4 minutes compared to the no-build project. Um, that doesn't make sense to me. It, it's comparing it with itself and saying there's an 8.4 minute difference. Um, I do think the no-build is a misnomer because it's assuming the ox lanes are already built. Um, and I'm going to run out of time, so I'll just stop. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I echo some other people's sentiments in that I like that this seems to be a low-cost low option. Um, I like that it sounds as though it can be implemented in a relatively short time frame. Um, and that it might offer some relief and um, that it might uh, um, begin to encourage increased transit use. These are all things that I like about this idea. Um, I hope, and this, I'm not a transportation planner, I, I hope that the bus on shoulder study option doesn't preclude other options for the highway as um, Brett just pointed out, things that are currently being studied in the UCIS, the HOV option, and also things that aren't in the UCIS, like actual bus rapid transit on the highway or a transit lane dedicated on the highway, things that might be cost comparable to a train on the rail corridor, um, but actually might prove to be a more effective and equitable option for those dollars. And as we learned from Mr. Grudinger and the congestion relief funding that's out there, if our county wanted it, I think we could get the funding for it. So a lot of this conversation is clearly being steered by what our county wants. And I am worried um, about the unified corridor study that we're still waiting for results on. One of the things that worries me most is um, Chairman Leopold's quote in the Good Times from Jan June 19th 
um, where he talks about the study. And it says, you know, there are going to be record, you know, the study is going to use data and make some points, and there are going to be recommendations from staff, but people will find the part of the report that most validates their point of view. The UCIS is not going to be a magical document that gives all kinds of answers. It's going to be open to interpretation. That's pretty normal. It may be normal, but it's almost a million dollars that we're spending on that study, and I certainly hope it will have some effective, actionable, achievable outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mark Mercedes Miller again. I just had a couple of comments. Um, what a great idea. This is like $8 million to get uh, some kind of improvement to our public transportation system, inspire people to get out of their cars, uh, reduce greenhouse gases. I, I think given that we're spending about $100 million on our auxiliary lanes project, this is a, a great investment and is a terrific pilot project. We can really see how much of a difference this will make. So I would encourage you to go with your staff recommendation and approve, uh, uh, make the approval necessary. Um, as far as uh, comments, though, I, I want to mention uh, two things that the presenter mentioned. One is that traffic seems to be very directional. Um, I'm finding that there's traffic in both directions almost any time. I mean, it, it almost doesn't seem to matter anymore, although there is a tendency maybe in the morning one way tenants in the afternoon, but gosh, I've been there at noon and had traffic in both directions stop. And then, uh, which kind of goes to the, mer the merge idea of having the uh, bus on shoulder in the ox lanes. My experience with the ox lanes is they back up just about as bad as the regular tra ha travel lanes. So there might, it might be worth, and I realize this is early, but you know, keeping our focus on shoulders rather than auxiliary lanes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap up the uh, public comment. I'll bring it back. I believe there's a motion ready to be made. A quick comment first, if that's acceptable to the chair. Sure. I, it was interesting, the comments from the public. Some people want us to spend the HOV lane money like as if we had it. The problem is we never could get it, and we're not going to. We're talking you know, $600 million, and that's why we went to Measure D, because we tried an HOV lane and went down in flames on it. Um, so that's not an option. We don't have money there we can transfer to something else. It's money we don't have, and that's part of the issue. Um, I, I think uh, I'm sure that uh, Director Leopold, uh, Commission Member Leopold, was not suggesting that the study's worthless that we're spent. It's just that he's, I, I can guarantee he's right that when it's all done, there'll be disagreements about what it means. That's a very different thing than saying the study is not, that there's no information there that a rational person could make use of to try and come up with a really good response. I will make the motion that we uh, authorize the executive director to enter into negotiations for a cooperative agreement with the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District, Metro, to fund the preparation of an operating concept for a bus on shoulder facility on Highway 1 between Soquel Drive and 41st Avenue interchanges. That's the first step of this process. I, I was second. So a motion by Rodkin, second by Leopold. Any other comments? Just a brief this? comment. Go ahead, Commissioner um, Leopold. The, you know, we are spending a lot of time thinking about what the future of transportation will be. Uh, let's not pick the, the fights that we've already had, have already been settled by the voters, and move on to the things that have been discussed with the voters and which they have funded and which we're trying to do. Um, this is an innovative uh, way to use our existing infrastructure in a way that we can actually afford. Uh, to, to those, as my colleague pointed out, to those who want to keep on pushing an HOV lane, as soon as you can find that money tree with the $364 million or the $500 million or to do the whole thing, maybe uh, three-quarters of a billion dollars, um, uh, uh, that's not something you can raise uh, 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 with individuals, uh, and it's not going to uh, come other ways. So we need to start thinking about other m uh, ways of moving people around on, on, on reliable schedules uh, so we can keep people moving here in Santa Cruz County. This is one way. I support it. Ms. Kaufman Gomez. Yes, I think also um, uh, with what Watsonville has made the, the sacrifice on is putting the money towards this um, type of a project, and I know that I'm in support of it as well because uh, we see that kind of impact and the frustration um, to move around. We know that we have a bottleneck. Uh, this won't be a perfect solution for that, and we're just hoping that there's alternatives that we can offer um, the taxpayers and uh, being able to resourcefully use their money, and also it's like it's about time. We're hearing some frustration of let's get something started instead of studying it to death. So I'm really looking forward to getting things moved and seeing some pavement um, improving, improvements. 
Other comments? I agree to get something going. I agree with you. Comments? Uh, I share the same enthusiasm. I think about uh, two years ago, we did a little project at the fish hook, less than $2 million. We got substantial relief from that. So this is one of those projects that with a little investment, we could get some uh, great results. So for that, I'll go ahead and uh, call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our regular agenda. Uh, can we get a review of items to be discussed in closed session? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, we do have a closed session scheduled uh, for you today. It's a conference for labor ne negotiators uh, uh, pursuant to government code uh, 54957.6 uh, with your uh, negotiators, Lozano Smith and uh, Yesenia Potter and the bargaining units, our RTC Association of Middle Managers and the uh, community of RTC employees. Excuse me, how many do we need for a uh, closed session, Luis? We need a, uh, well, you need a quorum of seven to... Uh, Randy, are you going to be able to stay for closed session? Oh, I, I just saw you got up. I didn't know if you were leaving. Okay. Excuse me. I just mean to interrupt you, Mr. Mendez. So you're completed with that? I'm done with that, yes. Okay. And do we expect to report anything out? We do not expect to report out, no. And I think we're going to hold the closed session in this room, not yes. not not. We're going to have it right here. Okay. So we're going to have to ask everybody to clear the room. We're going to hold closed sessions here. I'm going to go ahead and make an announcement that uh, our next meeting will be Thursday, September 6th of the Regional Transportation Commission at the Board of Supervisors in Sa Santa Cruz. And our next TPW meeting will be September 20th at 9 a.m. at the Santa Cruz City Council Chambers. Thank you. And we appreciate it if you could expedite clearing the room. Thank you. And turning off the mics. <laughs>